Hey what's up, it's, cute what if this side. Today we will be seeing, what if Deku was tiny. Now before we move ahead with the fic, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. For future what ifs like this. Despite the risks, I knew I had to find a way to communicate with my friends. My mother's house was too dangerous, and my training had taught me that heroes had to adapt and persevere. Today, I decided to seek out Momo Yayurazu. With her intelligence and resourcefulness, she might be able to help me return to my normal size. I found my way to her home, navigating the towering landscape with determination. Her study, a room filled with books and the scent of fresh ink, seemed the best place to wait for her. I climbed up onto her desk, a colossal expanse of polished wood scattered with papers, pens, and various study materials. From my tiny perspective, everything was a monumental obstacle, but I managed to find a relatively clear spot to wait time passed slowly as I paced back and forth, my heart PND with anticipation and anxiety. The familiar sound of a door opening filled the room, followed by a rush of air that felt like a powerful gust of wind to my minuscule form. Before I could react, the air current swept me off the desk. I tumbled through the air, my surroundings spinning wildly, before landing strong on the cushioned seat of Momo's chair. The impact knocked the wind out of me, and I lay there dazed, my vision swimming. For a few moments, I was too stunned to move. As my senses began to clear, I realized the danger I was in. The enormous figure of Momo stood in front of me, her back turned as she prepared to sit down. She was adjusting her skirt, completely unaware of my presence. Panic surged through me as I scrambled to my feet. I had to move, and fast. The seat of the chair stretched out around me like a vast plane, and I was in the dead center. My legs felt like lead as I forced myself to run, each step a desperate effort to escape the impending doom. I looked up, my heart PND in my chest. The shadow of Momo's descending form grew larger, darkening my world. Her skirt billowed slightly, a massive canopy that would soon engulf me. I pushed myself harder, my breaths coming in ragged gasps, but the chair seemed endless. The edge was too far, and Momo was descending too quickly. The shadow enveloped me completely, plunging me into darkness. I glanced over my shoulder one last time, seeing the underside of her skirt filling my entire field of vision. There was no escape. The immense weight of her body pressed down, the fabric of her skirt brushing against me as she settled into the chair. The pressure was immediate and overwhelming. I was pinned between the soft cushion and the unyielding mass of Momo's body. The fabric of her skirt and the cushion gave slightly, but there was no relief from the crushing force. My lungs burned as I struggled to breathe, the air pressed out of me by the enormous weight. I tried to scream, to thrash and push, but my tiny efforts were futile. Momo's vast form was a mountain, and I was nothing more than a speck beneath it. The soft material of her skirt surrounded me, pressing into my face and body. Every slight shift of her position brought a new wave of pressure, grinding me further into the cushion. My vision began to blur, darkness creeping in from the edges. My thoughts were a chaotic swirl of fear and resignation. I thought of my friends, of the life I had fought so strong to protect. I thought of Momo, sitting there, completely unaware that her mere presence was enough to end my life. The weight increased as she settled more comfortably into the chair, and I felt my body being compressed, the bones straining under the relentless force. The air grew thinner, my consciousness fading. The last sensation was the overwhelming pressure, the inescapable darkness, and the finality of it all Izuku Midoriya, the hero who had faced countless dangers, met his end not in a glorious battle, but in a moment of tragic insignificance. His life was extinguished beneath the unaware weight of a friend, leaving behind only the memory of his courage and determination. The world moved on, oblivious to the small tragedy that had unfolded in the quiet of a study room. The halls of Yue University were bustling with activity. It was just another typical day, or so I thought. My classes had gone smoothly, and I was taking a leisurely stroll through the corridor, my mind buzzing with thoughts about the latest hero techniques we discussed in Professor Aizawa's class. Little did I know, my life was about to take a dramatic and terrifying turn. As I walked, I started to feel a strange sensation in my stomach, a queasy feeling that grew stronger with each step. I paused, leaning against the wall for support, hoping the discomfort would pass. Instead, it intensified. A wave of dizziness hit me, and I felt like the ground was being pulled out from under me. I closed my eyes, trying to steady myself, but when I opened them again, the world around me had changed in the most surreal way possible. Everything was enormous. The floor, which had been right beneath my feet, now stretched out like an endless expanse. The towering figures of my fellow students loomed above me like skyscrapers. Panic surged through me as I realized what had happened, I had shrunk to the size of an ant. My mind raced, struggling to comprehend this nightmare. The bustling hallway, filled with giants who were oblivious to my presence, had become a dangerous obstacle course. 
Each step, they took scent tremors through the ground, threatening to crush me beneath their colossal feet. I had to move, and fast. I sprinted across the floor, my tiny legs working furiously. I dodged one giant foot after another, narrowly avoiding being squashed several times. The impact of their footsteps created gusts of wind that knocked me off balance, but I couldn't afford to stop. Every second counted, one student, a massive sneaker descending like a meteor, nearly ended my journey prematurely. I rolled to the side just in time, my heart PND in my chest. The sheer scale of everything was overwhelming, and the reality of my vulnerability hit me strong. I was completely at the mercy of these unaware giants. Desperation fueled my movements. I needed to find a safe spot, somewhere I could catch my breath and figure out what to do next. My eyes darted around, searching for any potential refuge. I spotted the base of a nearby potted plant, its leaves providing a small area of cover. With every ounce of energy I had left, I sprinted towards it. Reaching the plant felt like a small victory, but I knew it was just the beginning. I collapsed against the stem, gasping for air, my mind racing with thoughts of how to survive in this new, terrifying world. The hallway gradually cleared as students headed to their classrooms, giving me a brief respite from the constant threat of being crushed. However, the momentary calm was shattered by a new realization, I was now alone in an even more perilous environment. My only chance of survival was to find my friends and hope they could somehow help me. But where could they be? The answer came to me almost instantly the cafeteria. It was the one place where everyone gathered between classes. If I could make it there, I might have a chance of finding someone who could help me. The journey to the cafeteria would be long and fraught with danger, but I had no other option. I carefully navigated my way out of the plant's cover, taking advantage of the now quieter hallway. The track felt endless, every step an exhausting effort. The world around me was a series of insurmountable obstacles, the baseboards of the walls loomed like cliffs, and discarded pieces of paper became massive barricades. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I reached the entrance to the cafeteria. The double doors were propped open, a rare of luck. I slipped inside, only to be met with a whole new set of challenges. The cafeteria was packed, with students seated at tables that now seemed like towering mountains. The floor was a chaotic landscape of fallen crumbs and discarded napkins, each one a potential hazard. My eyes scanned the room, searching for familiar faces. There, at a table in the distance, I spotted my friends, Achako, Ida, and Todoroki. Relief washed over me, but it was quickly replaced by the daunting task ahead. I needed to reach them, and that meant climbing up to their table. I started my ascent, using the legs of the chairs and tables as my makeshift climbing wall. Each handhold was precarious, and every slip sent my heart racing. The journey was exhausting, my muscles burning with the effort, but I couldn't afford to stop. The table leg felt like an endless tower. I climbed inch by inch, my fingers gripping the rough wood. My mind focused on one goal, reaching the top and getting my friend's attention. It was the only way I could hope to find a solution to this nightmare. Hours seemed to pass as I climbed, my progress slow but steady. The world above me was a blur of gigantic figures and booming voices. I could hear snippets of conversation, the clatter of utensils, and the distant hum of the cafeteria's activity. It all felt surreal, like I was trapped in a nightmarish version of reality. Finally, with a final burst of effort, I pulled myself over the edge of the table. Exhausted and trembling, I lay there for a moment, catching my breath. The surface of the table was vast, a sprawling landscape that felt both familiar and alien. I pushed myself to my feet, scanning the horizon for my friends. There they were, just a short distance away, engaged in conversation and completely unaware of my presence. Relief and determination surged through me. I had made it this far, and now, I was close to the help I desperately needed. Standing atop the vast expanse of the cafeteria table, I felt a strange mixture of relief and dread. The giant figures of my friends loomed before me, their faces filled with laughter and animated conversation. The surface of the table was a sprawling landscape, littered with crumbs the size of boulders and utensils that appeared as massive as construction equipment. Each object was a stark reminder of my new, perilous existence. I focused on Achako, her warm smile and cheerful demeanor a beacon of hope. If I could just reach her, maybe she could help me. The task, however, was daunting. Her shirt rose before me like a sheer cliff, the fabric a patchwork of enormous threads and stitches. Determined, I began my ascent, using the tiny crevices in the material as handholds. The journey was grueling. My muscles strained with each pull, and the world around me swayed with Ochako's slightest movements. Her laughter, a sound so familiar and comforting, now boomed like thunder above me. As I climbed, the scent of her perfume filled the air, a sweet but overwhelming reminder of how small I had become. I made it to her chest, the rise and fall of her breathing like the gentle swell of a tide. 
But then, disaster struck. My grip slipped, and I plummeted downwards, the world spinning around me. I landed with a splash into a cold, clear pool at Chaco's cup of water. The shock of the icy water took my breath away. I floundered, struggling to stay afloat. The walls of the cup rose high above me, smooth and impossible to climb. Panic set in as I realized the gravity of my situation. I was trapped, and Ochako had no idea I was here. Before I could devise a plan, the world shifted. The cup was lifted, and I was thrown against the side by the sudden movement. Ochako was bringing the cup to her mouth, completely unaware of my presence. I screamed, but my tiny voice was lost in the vastness of the cafeteria. I looked up in horror as her enormous lips parted, revealing the cavernous mouth beyond. The cup tipped, and a torrent of water rushed towards her. I was caught in the current, powerless to resist. The last thing I saw was the darkness of her mouth closing around me, I was plunged into the warmth and darkness of her mouth. The noise was deafening the sound of her swallowing, and the rush of water echoing around me. I was swept towards her throat, the powerful muscles pulling me inexorably downwards. The sensation was terrifying and surreal. I was being swallowed alive by my friend, a helpless passenger on a journey I couldn't escape. As I was pulled down her esophagus, the world became a chaotic mix of sounds and sensations. The rhythmic contractions of her throat pushed me further into the darkness. I was no longer in control of my fate. I was at the mercy of her body's natural functions. The descent seemed to last an eternity, each moment a reminder of my utter helplessness as I landed with a plop in her stomach acid. My Hero Academia fanfiction, an ant's perspective. It's strong to believe how quickly life can turn upside down. One moment, I was Izuku Midoriya, aspiring hero, diligently studying in my room, and the next, I was a speck, a microscopic version of myself, the size of an ant. It all started one fateful afternoon. It was a typical Sunday afternoon, and I was engrossed in my studies, attempting to decipher the intricacies of hero tactics and strategies. The sunlight streamed through my window, casting a warm glow over my notebooks and textbooks scattered across the desk. I was in deep concentration when suddenly, an inexplicable sensation washed over me. I felt my body tingling, then shrinking at an alarming rate. Before I could comprehend what was happening, I found myself standing on my desk, looking up at my colossal surroundings. My first thought was panic. What happened? Why am I so small? I muttered, my voice sounding comically high-pitched to my own ears. I looked around, the vast expanse of my desk now a gigantic landscape. My notebooks towered over me like skyscrapers, and my pencils resembled enormous logs. As I stood there, trying to make sense of my predicament, I heard the familiar creak of the door opening. My heart skipped a beat. It was my mom, Inko Midoriya. Her footsteps, which had always been so gentle, now reverberated through the room like thunderclaps. Each step sent vibrations through the desk, making me lose my balance. Mom, wait, I shouted, but my voice was too tiny to reach her ears. She entered the room, humming a tune as she tidied up, completely oblivious to her shrunken son. The first near-death experience came swiftly. As she dusted off the desk, her massive hand swooped down with a duster. I barely had time to react, diving out of the way as the duster swept across the surface, sending a gust of wind that knocked me off my feet. I tumbled, rolling dangerously close to the edge of the desk. I managed to grab hold of a pencil, hanging on for dear life. Mom, please see me, I yelled again, but it was no use. She continued cleaning, her movements methodical and unstoppable. I climbed back onto the desk, my tiny limbs trembling from the effort. I had to find a way to get her attention. After narrowly avoiding the duster, I thought the worst was over, but I was wrong. Inko decided to sweep the floor next. From my vantage point, the broom was an enormous beast, its bristles like a forest of sharp, unyielding trees. As she swept under the desk, the broom's bristles caught me, lifting me into the air. I was tossed around like a ragdoll, clinging to one of the bristles as the broom moved back and forth. The world was a blur of motion and sound. I had to find a way to escape before I was swept away completely. Summoning all my strength, I let go of the bristle at just the right moment, landing in a heap on the floor. No sooner had I escaped the broom than I faced another peril. My mom's footsteps were like earthquakes, each one shaking the ground and sending me sprawling. I watched in horror as her gigantic foot descended toward me. The sole of her slipper was like a massive, descending sky. I rolled to the side just in time, feeling the rush of air as her foot came down mere millimeters from where I had been. I couldn't stay on the floor, it was too dangerous. I needed to get back to the relative safety of the desk. As I scrambled up the leg of the chair, I realized how truly fragile my situation was. Every movement, every action my mom took was a potential threat to my tiny existence. I made it back to the desk, but safety was still elusive. Inko decided to reorganize my study materials. 
her hands moved with practiced efficiency, stacking books and papers. I was on top of a pile of notebooks when she lifted it, causing me to slide down the side. I grabbed onto the edge of a sheet of paper, hanging on as she moved the pile. The paper slipped, and I was sent tumbling into a crevice between the books. It was dark and cramped, and I could hear my own heartbeat PND in my ears. I struggled to climb out, emerging just as Inko placed another stack of books on top of the pile. I dodged the falling tomes, each one a potential crushing weight. Just when I thought I had experienced every possible danger, Inko brought out the vacuum cleaner. The roar of the machine was deafening, and the suction powerful enough to pull me off my feet. I was caught in the current, helplessly drawn toward the nozzle. I grabbed onto the edge of the desk, my tiny fingers slipping. In a desperate bid for survival, I let go and was SCK into the vacuum bag. The darkness was all-encompassing, the air thin and stale. I could barely breathe, surrounded by dust and debris. I knew I had to find a way out before the lack of oxygen overcame me. Inside the vacuum bag, I struggled to move. Every breath was a struggle, and the dust made me cough uncontrollably. I felt around in the darkness, searching for an opening. My fingers brushed against the edge of the bag, and I found a small tear. I widened it just enough to squeeze through, emerging covered in dust but alive. I tumbled out of the vacuum cleaner, landing on the floor once again. I was exhausted, but I couldn't give up. I had to make my mom see me. I climbed onto the nearest object, a chair leg, and began to ascend once more. My limbs ached, and my vision was blurry, but I pushed on. At long last, I reached the top of the desk again. Inko was just finishing her cleaning, a satisfied smile on her face. I waved my arms frantically, shouting with all the strength I had left. Mom, down here, it's me, Izuku. Finally, she noticed me. Her eyes widened, and she leaned in closer. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. Her expression changed from one of surprise to one of disgust. You, a bug, she exclaimed. Before I could react, she picked me up between her fingers, her grip surprisingly gentle but firm. I tried to shout, to make her understand, but she was already moving toward the window. She opened it, and, with a flick of her wrist, dropped me outside into the garden. I landed in the grass, the soft blades cushioning my fall. I looked up at the towering house, my home, now a distant mountain. Inko smiled, satisfied that she had rid the house of a pesky insect. I watched as she closed the window, leaving me alone in the garden. I sat there for a moment, taking in my new surroundings. The garden was a jungle, every flower a towering tree, every blade of grass a towering pillar. Despite everything, I couldn't help but marvel at the world from this new perspective. I knew I had to find a way to return to my normal size, but for now, I would survive. After all, I was Izuku Midoriya, and heroes never give up. No matter the size of the challenge, I would find a way to overcome it. As I began to explore my new environment, I couldn't help but smile at the absurdity of it all. Life as a tiny hero was full of unexpected dangers, but it also offered a unique perspective on the world. I would figure out what had caused my sudden shrinkage and find a way back to my normal size. Until then, I would navigate this new world, just another chapter in the journey of becoming the greatest hero. And who knows, maybe this experience would teach me something valuable, something that would make me a better hero in the long run. After all, even the smallest of us can make a big difference. Title, An Unexpected Lesson in Heroism I always believed that the life of a hero would be full of challenges, and I was ready to face them all head-on. Little did I know that my biggest challenge would come not from villains or tests, but from a seemingly ordinary day at home. It started like any other day. I was sitting at my desk, surrounded by textbooks and notes, trying to make sense of complex hero theories. The sun streamed through the window, casting a warm glow over my study area. My mom, Inko Midoriya, was busy with her daily chores, humming a tune as she cleaned the house. Her presence was always comforting, a reminder that I had a safe place to come back to after my grueling training sessions. As I focused on a particularly difficult problem, a strange sensation washed over me. It was as if the world around me was expanding. My desk seemed to grow larger, and the letters in my textbook became harder to read. Panic set in when I realized that it wasn't the world growing, it was me shrinking. In a matter of moments, I found myself reduced to the size of an ant, stranded on my colossal desk. What the? I muttered, looking around in disbelief. My heart PND in my chest as I tried to process what was happening. This had to be some kind of quirk malfunction, but I'd never heard of anything like this before. I had to get help, and fast. I looked up to see my giant mother entering the room, oblivious to my predicament. She carried a feather duster and a bright smile, ready to tackle the dust that had accumulated in my room. To her, it was just another routine cleaning session. To me, it was the beginning of a nightmare. Mom! Down here, I screamed, waving my arms frantically. 
my voice, barely a whisper at my current size, was lost in the vast expanse of the room. She didn't even glance in my direction as she began dusting the shelves, her massive footsteps shaking the ground beneath me. I darted to the edge of the desk, trying to stay out of her way. The feather duster swept across the surface, sending a gust of wind that nearly blew me off my feet. I clung to a pencil, my tiny body trembling with fear. Each sweep of the duster was a near-death experience, and I knew I had to find a safer place. As I made my way to the edge of the desk, I saw my mom's hand reaching for a stack of papers. She absentmindedly shuffled them, causing a paper avalanche that sent me tumbling to the floor. I landed with a thud, the wind knocked out of me. When I looked up, I saw her massive foot coming down, and I rolled out of the way just in time to avoid being crushed. I had to find a way to get her attention. Maybe if I climbed onto something higher, she would see me. But the room was a dangerous landscape at my size. Every piece of furniture was a towering structure. Every step my mom took was a potential death sentence. I sprinted towards the bookshelf, hoping to scale it and wave at her from a higher vantage point. My tiny legs moved as fast as they could, but progress was slow. I reached the base of the bookshelf and began climbing, using the tiny imperfections in the wood as footholds. Halfway up, I felt the vibrations of her footsteps again. She was approaching the bookshelf, a dust cloth in hand. I clung to the wood, my heart racing. If she dusted the shelves now, I would be wiped away like a speck of dirt. I had to hold on and hope she wouldn't notice me. The cloth swept across the shelf just above my head, sending a cloud of dust into the air. I coughed and sputtered, trying to keep my grip. But the next swipe was lower, closer, and I lost my footing. I fell, flailing, and landed on the edge of a book. My mom's hand reached for the book, pulling it off the shelf. I was thrown into the air, tumbling down with the book. I hit the floor strong, pain shooting through my tiny body. I lay there, dazed, as my mom flipped through the pages, completely unaware of the chaos she was causing. I needed to get her attention, but how? I was too small, my voice too faint. Desperation set in as I thought about my options. Maybe I could get to her phone and send a message, or find something to make a noise. As I pondered my next move, my mom moved to the desk again. This time, she was rearranging my things, oblivious to the tiny figure below. I saw her reach for my laptop and had an idea. If I could climb onto the keyboard, maybe I could type out a message. I made my way back to the desk, avoiding her massive feet. Climbing up the chair leg was a challenge, but I managed to reach the top. I scrambled onto the keyboard, the keys like giant platforms beneath me. I began to type, but the keys were too large for me to press down properly. Frustration and fear bubbled up inside me. Mom, please, look down here, I screamed, but my tiny voice was drowned out by the sound of her moving my books. She leaned over the desk, her face looming like a giant's, but her eyes didn't focus on me. My mom moved to the kitchen, leaving me stranded on the desk once more. I had to think fast. I decided to try climbing down to the floor and running towards the living room, where she usually relaxed after cleaning. Maybe if I got close enough, she would see me. I carefully descended from the desk, using the chair and a series of makeshift ropes from my discarded clothes. The journey down was perilous, but I made it to the floor without incident. I began the long trek across the vast expanse of the living room. Halfway there, I felt the familiar tremors of her footsteps. She was returning, and I was directly in her path. I sprinted towards the safety of the couch, my legs burning with the effort. But I wasn't fast enough. Her foot came down inches from me, the impact sending me sprawling. I looked up, breathe, and saw her heading towards the kitchen counter. I had one last chance. I ran, using every ounce of strength I had left, and reached the base of the counter. Climbing up the smooth surface was impossible, but I spotted a towel hanging down. Using it as a rope, I climbed, my muscles aching with the effort. I reached the top just as my mom leaned forward to grab something. Her massive form cast a shadow over me, and I saw the danger too late. Her breasts, covered by her shirt, loomed over me like twin mountains. I screamed, trying to run, but there was nowhere to go. I felt the pressure as she leaned down, my body caught between the countertop and her chest. The world went dark, and I struggled to breathe. My tiny body was no match for the immense weight pressing down on me. I gasped, my vision blurring as I tried to call out one last time, Mom. Please. The pressure increased, and I felt my bones creak. My limbs were pinned, unable to move, and the force pressed the air out of my lungs. I tried to squirm, to find some way to escape, but every slight movement only increased the agony. Her breasts, soft yet overwhelmingly heavy at my size, conformed to the countertop, creating a seal that trapped me in place. My vision began to tunnel as the lack of oxygen and the crushing force took their toll. Each second felt like an eternity, the weight of her body compressing my chest and abdomen, squeezing the life out of me. 
I could hear her heartbeat, a rhythmic thud that reminded me of how alive she was. Completely unaware of my plight desperation surged through me, and with the last of my strength, I tried to push against the unyielding mass. My hands pressed against the fabric of her shirt, but it was like trying to move a mountain. The scent of her detergent filled my nostrils, a stark contrast to the dire situation I was in. My bones began to crack under the relentless pressure, sending waves of excruciating pain through my body. Mom. Can't. Breathe. I mouthed silently, tears streaming down my face. My vision blurred further, darkness creeping in from the edges. I was losing the battle, my body giving out under the immense stress. The pressure reached its peak, and I felt a sharp, final pain as my ribs gave way, collapsing inward. My entire body was engulfed in a wave of pain so intense that my mind could barely process it. The world faded to black, my consciousness slipping away as I succumbed to the crushing force. In the end, it wasn't a villain or a dangerous mission that ended me. It was a simple, everyday moment, a reminder of how fragile life can be. As my consciousness slipped away, I hoped that someone would find out what happened, that my friends would understand. And maybe, just maybe, this would serve as a lesson for heroes everywhere. Even the smallest things can have the biggest impacts. Shrunken reality. Zuku Midoriya. The halls of Yua University buzzed with the usual hustle and bustle of students and faculty members rushing to their next classes or catching up with friends. It was just another ordinary day or so I thought. I had been walking towards the library, my mind preoccupied with thoughts about the latest quirk theory I had been studying. Suddenly, a wave of dizziness washed over me. My vision blurred, and my limbs felt weak. I stumbled, reaching out to the wall for support. But before I could understand what was happening, everything around me began to expand, or was I shrinking? Panic set in as the ground seemed to rush up towards me. The hallway, once filled with students at my height, now towered like a colossal canyon. I tried to scream, to call for help, but my voice was too small to be heard over the cacophony of footsteps and chatter. I was no larger than an ant, completely invisible to the giants walking around me. Each footstep was a potential disaster, each shoe a mountain that could crush me in an instant. The ground vibrated with the impact of their steps, sending shockwaves through my tiny body. I needed to move, and fast. I darted towards the edge of the hallway, narrowly avoiding the descending foot of a girl who was deep in conversation with her friend. The breeze from her step knocked me off balance, but I managed to roll to safety under a nearby bench. For a moment, I allowed myself to catch my breath. The enormity of my situation was sinking in. How could this have happened? Was it a villain's attack? A side effect of someone's quirk? Questions flooded my mind, but there was no time to dwell on them. Survival was my priority. I surveyed my surroundings. The bench provided some cover, but it wasn't a permanent solution. I needed to find a safer place, somewhere I could figure out my next move without the constant threat of being squished. Then I noticed the air vent. It was a few inches above the ground, its grill slightly ajar. It seemed like my best bet. With a final glance at the hallway to ensure the coast was clear, I sprinted towards the vent and squeezed through the gap. Inside the vent, the world was a maze of metal tunnels. The air was cooler here, and the noise from the hallway was muffled. It was a different kind of vastness, one that was cold and unfeeling. The walls of the vent stretched upwards like the cliffs of a canyon, and the floor beneath me was a smooth, metallic surface that seemed to stretch on forever. I trudged forward, each step echoing in the confined space. Time lost its meaning as I walked, the repetitive scenery blending together. My muscles ached, and my throat was dry. Just as despair began to creep in, a sudden breeze swept through the vent. The force of the wind was too strong for my tiny frame. It lifted me off my feet and sent me tumbling through the air. I tried to grab onto the sides of the vent, but it was no use. I was at the mercy of the wind, flying through the vent system at breakneck speed. Ahead, I saw the faint outline of a grate. Before I could react, I was propelled through it, hurtling out of the vent and into a vast open space. I crashed onto a soft surface, the impact knocking the wind out of me. Dazed, I struggled to get my bearings. As my vision cleared, I realized I was lying on a pink pair of panties. The delicate fabric felt like a trampoline beneath my tiny body. I tried to stand, but my legs were shaky from the ordeal. Before I could fully comprehend my surroundings, a series of booming noises echoed through the room. The sound of lockers opening and closing, and the thunderous steps of giants moving about. I was in the girls' locker room. My heart pned in my chest as I lay there, trying to make sense of my situation. The voices of the girls were loud and disorienting, their conversations blending into a background roar. Just as I began to formulate a plan to escape, a shadow loomed over me. I looked up, my BLD running cold. A giant hand descended, reaching for the panties I was on. Panic surged through me, but there was nowhere to run. 
The hand grasped the fabric, lifting it and me into the air. I clung to the panties, my body pressed against the soft material. As the hand moved, I lost my grip and tumbled deeper into the panties, landing in the crotch area. My heart raced as I realized where this was going. The panties were being lifted up a pair of legs. Desperation took hold. I tried to climb out, but the fabric was too slippery. I could only watch in horror as the giant loomed above me, getting closer and closer. Then, with a sickening inevitability, the panties made contact, and I was pushed inside. The darkness was overwhelming, the air thick and humid. I could feel the walls of flesh around me, slick and unyielding. I tried to scream, but my voice was muffled. I struggled to find a way out, but every movement only seemed to pull me deeper. I was trapped, completely and utterly, inside a giant girl's. The realization was a crushing weight. I was so small that she couldn't even feel me squirming. Every attempt to escape was futile. The walls were too slick, and I kept slipping back down. I had to keep trying. I couldn't give up. I clawed and climbed, fighting against the slick walls. My muscles burned, my mind racing with fear and determination. I had to survive. I had to find a way out of this nightmare. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I managed to reach a stable position. I was exhausted, my body trembling from the effort. I lay there, breathe, trying to gather my strength for another attempt to escape. But as I lay there, I couldn't help but think about the sheer impossibility of my situation. How could I, Izuku Midoriya, the future symbol of peace, be reduced to this? The thought was a bitter pill to swallow. I had to find a way out, not just for myself, but for everyone who depended on me. I couldn't let this be the end of my story. I would fight, no matter how hopeless it seemed. With renewed determination, I prepared to make another attempt to climb out. I couldn't let despair win. I had to keep going. For all might, for my friends, for myself. The walls were slick, the air was stifling, but I pressed on. My fingers ached from gripping the slippery surfaces, my legs trembling from the exertion. Each inch gained was a victory, but also a reminder of the vast distance still to go. I clawed and climbed, my muscles burning with every movement. My progress was slow, agonizingly slow. The walls seemed to close in around me, the darkness pressing on my mind. I was losing strength, my body screaming for rest, but I couldn't afford to stop. I had to keep moving, to keep fighting. But no matter how strong I tried, fatigue began to set in. My arms felt like lead, my legs barely responding to my commands. I slipped again and again, each fall more demoralizing than the last. The slick walls were unyielding, indifferent to my struggle. I tried to scream, to call for help, but my voice was too faint, lost in the vastness around me. Despair clawed at my heart as I realized the hopelessness of my situation. My strength was fading, my willpower weakening. The relentless environment was winning. Eventually, my body could take no more. My muscles gave out, and I collapsed against the slick wall, breathe heavily. My vision blurred, my mind fogged with exhaustion. I wanted to keep fighting, to keep struggling, but my body refused to obey. As I lay there, the oppressive darkness closing in, I felt a profound sense of loss. My dreams, my aspirations, everything I had fought for seemed so distant, so unreachable. I was just a tiny speck, lost in a world that didn't care about my existence. With my last remaining strength, I tried to claw my way up one final time, but my body was too weak. I slipped and fell, the darkness swallowing me whole. My vision dimmed, my breath shallow. I had given it my all, but it wasn't enough. In my final moments, my thoughts turned to my friends, my mentors, and the dreams I had held so dearly. I hoped, in some small way, that my efforts hadn't been in vain, that my friends would carry on, that they would fight for the future we all believed in. As the darkness claimed me, I felt a strange sense of peace. I had fought as strong as I could, and while my story was ending in this nightmarish place, I held on to the hope that others would continue the fight. With one last, shuddering breath, I closed my eyes, surrendering to the darkness. My story had ended, lost in the vast, indifferent world of giants. As I sat at my desk, the pages of my hero notebook spread out before me, I couldn't help but feel the familiar rush of excitement. I'd been jotting down notes on different hero techniques, analyzing the pros and cons of various quirks, and planning strategies for future battles. Even on my days off, my mind never stopped thinking about heroes and how I could become the greatest one of all. I felt a strange, sudden dizziness, and my vision blurred for a moment. I shook my head to clear it, but the sensation only intensified. The room seemed to be expanding around me, and I felt myself shrinking. My heart raced as panic set in. I was shrinking. In a matter of seconds, I was no bigger than an ant, standing on the vast wooden plane of my desk. I looked around frantically, trying to make sense of what had just happened. The once ordinary objects in my room now loomed like colossal structures. 
My notebook, a sprawling landscape of white pages, seemed to stretch on forever. Mom, mom, help, I shouted, but my voice was a mere squeak, lost in the vastness of the room. Just then, I heard the familiar sound of my mother's footsteps approaching. Each step was a thunderous boom that reverberated through my tiny body. I watched in horror as my bedroom door swung open, and my mother, Inko Midoriya, stepped inside. Just doing some cleaning, Izuku, she called out, her voice like the roar of a giant. She had no idea what had happened to me. I tried to wave my arms, jump up and down, anything to get her attention, but it was no use. Her gaze was focused on the task at hand. She picked up a dust cloth and began wiping down the surfaces in my room. I watched as her massive hand moved closer and closer to my desk. No, mom, I'm right here, I screamed, but my tiny voice was drowned out by the rustling of the cloth. Her hand descended like a wrecking, the cloth sweeping across the desk with terrifying speed. I barely managed to leap out of the way in time, landing strong on the wooden surface. I lay there, breathe, my heart PND in my chest, but there was no time to rest. My mother had moved on to dusting the shelves above my desk. Her movements sent vibrations through the desk, shaking me to my core. I struggled to stand, but the shaking made it nearly impossible. Suddenly, a book dislodged from the shelf above and came crashing down towards me. I dove to the side, narrowly avoiding being crushed beneath its weight. The impact sent me sprawling, and I lay there, dazed and disoriented. I looked up to see my mother, still oblivious to my plight, moving around the room with the same methodical precision. I needed to get her attention somehow. I started running towards the edge of the desk, hoping to find a way to climb down, but before I could reach the edge, my mother's hand came swooping down again, this time with a feather duster. I was caught off guard, and the duster's soft bristles knocked me off my feet, sending me tumbling across the desk. I came to a stop near the edge, clinging to a pencil for support. I could see my mother's colossal figure moving about the room, her back turned to me. I took a deep breath and began to climb down the pencil, hoping to reach the floor where I might have a better chance of getting her attention. But as I descended, I lost my grip and fell, landing on the cold, strong surface of the desk drawer. The drawer was open just enough for me to slip through the gap and onto the floor. I picked myself up and started running towards my mother, who was now busy dusting the shelves near the window. I had to dodge fallen objects and navigate through a maze of wires and clutter, but I was determined to reach her. As I ran, I could feel the vibrations of her movements through the floor. Each step she took was like an earthquake, shaking the ground beneath me. I had to be careful not to get caught underfoot. I finally made it to her feet, which were like towering pillars. I waved my arms and shouted as loud as I could, but my tiny voice was no match for the sound of her cleaning. Desperation filled me as I realized that I was too small for her to notice. I needed to find a way to climb up to her, to get her attention. I spotted a cord hanging down from the window blinds and ran towards it. Climbing the cord was difficult, but I managed to make my way up, hand over hand, until I was level with the windowsill. From there, I jumped onto the windowsill and began running towards the countertop where my mother was now wiping with a cloth. I had to be quick, she was moving fast, and I needed to reach her before she finished cleaning and left the room. I reached the edge of the windowsill and jumped onto the counter, landing strong but rolling to break my fall. I stood up and ran towards her, waving my arms and shouting, but my efforts were in vain. She was focused on her task, completely unaware of my presence. I saw her hand coming towards me, the cloth ready to wipe the surface clean. I tried to move out of the way, but I was too slow. The cloth rolled over me, trapping me in its fibers. I was caught in a whirlwind of dust and dirt, my tiny body tossed around like a ragdoll. I could hear my own screams, but they were muffled by the thick cloth. I was carried to the edge of the countertop, and before I knew it, I was falling. I flailed my arms, trying to grab onto something, anything, to stop my descent. But there was nothing to hold on to. I hit the bottom of the garbage can with a sickening thud, landing in a pool of sticky liquid. I was dazed, disoriented, and covered in grime. I tried to stand, but my legs were weak, and the sticky liquid made it difficult to move. I looked up, seeing the opening of the garbage can far above me, the light filtering in through the cracks. Mom, mom, I'm down here, I shouted, but my voice was swallowed by the walls of the can. I could hear her moving about the room, oblivious to my plight. Days went by, and I remained stuck at the bottom of the garbage can. My only solace was the occasional glimpse of my mother's face as she dumped more garbage on top of me. Each time the lid opened, I tried to scream for help, but my voice was too small to be heard. I watched as the days turned into a blur of darkness and light, the only constant being the smell of garbage and the weight of debris piling on top of me. I felt myself growing weaker, my hope dwindling with each passing day. I tried to keep my spirits up, telling myself that someone would find me eventually, that this nightmare would end. 
but as the days turned into a week, my hope began to fade. One day, I heard the familiar sound of my mother's footsteps approaching the garbage can. The lid was lifted, and I looked up to see her giant face peering down at me. For a moment, I thought she had seen me, that she would finally rescue me, but she simply tied up the bag and lifted it out of the can. I felt myself being carried, the world swaying with each step she took. I was jostled and shaken, but I was too weak to cry out. I heard the sound of the front door opening, and then the rush of wind as we stepped outside. My mother carried the bag to the curb and set it down. I could see the blue sky above, the bright sunlight filtering through the plastic. Goodbye, Mom, I whispered, my voice barely audible even to myself. I closed my eyes, the weight of exhaustion and despair pressing down on me. The last thing I heard was the sound of the garbage truck approaching, its mechanical jaws opening wide to swallow the bag and everything inside it. My life as Izuku Midoriya, the aspiring hero, ended in the darkness of the garbage truck. My dreams, my hopes, and my aspirations were all buried beneath the weight of discarded trash. I had wanted to be the greatest hero, to save others and make a difference in the world. But in the end, I couldn't even save myself. The Shrinking Hero My name is Izuku Midoriya, and unlike most of the population, I wasn't born with a quirk. For the longest time, I thought I'd never become a hero. That changed when I turned 10. One day, while playing in the park, I felt an odd sensation. Suddenly, everything around me grew larger, and I realized I was shrinking. It was terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. My quirk had manifested, I could shrink myself and others to a mere inch tall. Over the years, I learned to control and MSTR my quirk. The ability to shrink gave me a unique perspective on the world and heroism. I loved the freedom it gave me, the ability to explore and hide, unnoticed by those around me. The feeling of being tiny in a vast world fascinated me, and I would seize any opportunity to practice and refine my abilities. Attending Yua High School was a dream come true. Surrounded by aspiring heroes, each with their unique quirks, I felt at home. Despite the rigorous training and challenges, I found time to indulge in my peculiar fascination with being tiny. Unbeknownst to my friends, I would often shrink myself and hitch rides on their shoulders. The thrill of navigating the world from an inch-tall perspective never got old. One of my favorite people to ride with was Suyu Asui, or Tsu, as we affectionately called her. Her calm demeanor and keen senses made her an ideal subject for my sacred adventures. Plus, her agile movements and unique quirk provided an added layer of excitement. It was a sunny afternoon at Yua the day had been filled with intense training, and everyone was looking forward to some downtime. I decided it was the perfect opportunity to shrink and enjoy a ride on Sue's shoulder. As usual, I waited until she was alone, and then activated my quirk, reducing myself to an inch tall. I leaped onto her shoulder just as she began to walk towards the dorms. The ride was smooth at first. Sue's gentle pace and rhythmic movements were almost soothing. I clung to her collar, enjoying the breeze and the distant chatter of students. Suddenly, Sue came to an abrupt halt. She was talking to someone, and I peered over her shoulder to see who it was. Before I could get a good look, a slight jostle sent me tumbling forward. I tried to grab onto her shirt, but my tiny hands couldn't find a grip. I fell, landing with a soft thud between Sue's breasts. For a moment, I was stunned. The world around me had transformed into a sweltering, dark canyon. Sue's heartbeat reverberated around me, a constant, powerful rhythm. Her skin was warm and slightly damp with sweat, and I realized with a mix of horror and fascination that I was wedged tightly between her breasts. I tried to stand up, but Sue started walking again. Her breasts jiggled with each step, tossing me around like a tiny ragdoll. Every time I tried to find my footing, I was thrown off balance. I was at the mercy of her movements, bouncing and sliding with every motion. As the day went on, I found myself adapting to the situation. Initially, I was focused on trying to escape, or at least find a stable position. But as time passed, I couldn't deny the strange thrill of the experience. The constant motion, the warmth, the closeness to Tsuit was all so surreal. However, the occasional giant beads of sweat that splashed onto me were less enjoyable, drenching me in salty water. The day felt endless, each moment stretching into an eternity. Sue attended classes, met with friends, and trained, all while I remained trapped in my humid, confined space. Despite the discomfort, I began to appreciate the unique perspective. It was an NTMT glimpse into a day in Sue's life, experienced in a way no one else ever could. I felt every laugh, every sigh, every quickened heartbeat. I could hear the muffled sounds of conversations and the rustling of fabric. It was an oddly immersive experience, making me feel closer to Tsu than ever before. The constant motion, the subtle shifts in temperature, the rhythmic sway it was almost hypnotic. As the sun began to set, signaling the end of the day, 
I felt a mixture of relief and disappointment. I was exhausted, drenched in sweat, and sore from being tossed around. Although a part of me didn't want the adventure to end. I had grown strangely fond of the rhythmic movements and the NTMT environment. Finally, Sue made her way to her room. I felt her movement slow down, and she sat on her bed. She began to change out of her clothes, and I seized the opportunity. As her shirt lifted, I scrambled to get out, sliding down her chest and onto her bedspread. I quickly grew back to my normal size, breathing heavily and feeling a mix of exhilaration and exhaustion. Lying on my bed that night, I couldn't stop thinking about the day's events. The experience had been intense and overwhelming, but also strangely fulfilling. I realized that my fascination with being tiny wasn't just about the thrill or the challenge. It was about seeing the world from a different perspective, experiencing life in a way no one else could. The day spent between Sue's breasts had been one that I will remember forever. In the vibrant world of my hero academia, where heroes and quirks are commonplace, my life has always been a bit different. My name is Izuku Midoriya, and like everyone else, I have a quirk. Unlike most, my quirk doesn't make me stronger or faster. Instead, it allows me to shrink to the size of an ant at will. Not only that, but my body has turned into RBB, granting me resilience beyond the ordinary. I've always been fascinated by the world from a tiny perspective, the way everything seems so vast and majestic. My quirk has granted me a unique outlook, and I love every moment of it. It was a sunny afternoon when I overheard the hero Midnight, also known as Nimari Kayama, talking on the phone. Her voice was playful and melodious as she discussed plans to meet up with some fellow heroes. My heart skipped a beat with excitement, as I realized this was a perfect opportunity for some exploration, an idea quickly formed in my mind, one that I couldn't resist. As soon as she hung up the phone, I activated my quirk. I felt the familiar sensation of my body compressing, the world around me expanding exponentially. I was now only two inches tall, standing on the floor of the U.S. staff lounge. Midnight's towering figure loomed above me, and I couldn't help but marvel at the sheer scale of everything. Without wasting any time, I sprinted towards her, my tiny feet tapping lightly against the floor. She was wearing a pair of form-fitting jeans, and I knew this would be a challenge. Challenges were what made my quirk so exhilarating. I reached the base of her jeans and began my ascent, gripping the coarse denim fabric with my hands. Climbing up Midnight's jeans was no easy feat. Her legs moved slightly as she continued her conversation, causing me to pause and regain my balance multiple times. Each step she took was a seismic event in my miniature world, and I clung tightly to avoid being shaken off. It was a laborious journey, taking nearly half an hour to reach her back pocket. By the time I arrived, my muscles were burning, but the thrill of the adventure kept me going. The pocket itself was a tight squeeze, even at my size. I wedged myself into the small opening just as she hung up the phone. Midnight started walking, and I was immediately subjected to the relentless pressure of being flattened against the fabric. Each step she took was a mix of pressure and release, pressing me flat, and then allowing me to spring back into shape. It was an incredible test of the endurance of my RBB body, and I relished every moment. From my vantage point, I could hear the muffled sounds of the world outside, the distant hum of cars, the chatter of people passing by, and the rhythmic thud of midnight's footsteps. Every now and then, she would stop, causing me to be squished more firmly into the pocket. The denim fabric pressed against me, and I could feel every contour and seam. Despite the constant pressure, I felt a strange sense of comfort. Being so close to midnight, even though she was unaware of my presence, was oddly reassuring. It was a reminder of how much I admired her, not just as a hero, but as a person. My mind wandered to the times she had supported me and encouraged me in my journey to become a hero. This moment, though unconventional, was another way for me to be close to someone I looked up to. As she walked, I continued to test the limits of my RBB body. Each step she took flattened me, but I quickly rebounded, ready for the next. I could feel the resilience in my limbs, the flexibility of my form. It was a strange, exhilarating sensation, being both vulnerable and invincible at the same time. I wondered how many other people with quirks had ever experienced something like this. Eventually, I felt the motion slow down, and I knew we had arrived at our destination. Midnight stopped, and I heard the sound of voices greeting her. She had met up with some of the other pro heroes. I stayed perfectly still, listening to their conversation, the friendly banter and laughter. It was a slice of normalcy in my otherwise extraordinary life. After a while, the conversation lulled, and I felt Midnight sit down. The pressure in the pocket increased as she settled into her seat, pressing me even more firmly against the fabric. I took a deep breath, feeling the tightness, but also the support. It was a perfect opportunity to take a break and reflect on my adventure. 
From this vantage point, I could only imagine the scene unfolding around me, Midnight and her friends chatting, enjoying their time together. I felt a pang of guilt for intruding on her privacy, but the excitement of my exploration outweighed I was learning more about my quirk, testing its limits, and discovering new facets of my abilities. After what felt like an eternity, I felt Midnight stand up again. The pressure eased, and I knew it was time to make my exit. Carefully, I wriggled my way out of the pocket and began my descent. Climbing down was just as challenging as climbing up, but I relished every moment. By the time I reached the floor, I was exhausted but exhilarated. I reverted to my normal size, feeling the world shrink back to its usual proportions. Midnight was still engrossed in her conversation, unaware of my little adventure. I smiled to myself, feeling a sense of accomplishment and excitement for the next time I could use my quirk in such a thrilling way. As I walked away, I couldn't help but think about all the possibilities my quirk offered. The world was a vast and wondrous place, and I was eager to explore every inch of it, one tiny step at a time. Alternate ending Izuku was stuck inside a giant woman's. I lay in the oppressive darkness, my tiny body covered in the viscous lubricant that coated the walls of my living prison. Time had lost all meaning, seconds felt like hours, and the stifling, humid air only added to my growing despair. Each breath was a struggle, the scent of the giantess's arsenal all around me, a constant reminder of my dire predicament. My clothes were soaked through, sticking to my skin uncomfortably. I had no way of telling how long I had been trapped. Days, perhaps, there was no way to know. The rhythmic contractions of the giantess's muscles around me were a grim lullaby, lulling me into a state of hopelessness. Suddenly, the walls around me began to tremble and shake violently. My heart pned in my chest as the temperature seemed to rise, and more lubricant was secreted, coating me even further. I struggled to stand, my footing treacherous on the slick surfaces. The vibrations grew stronger, each one a powerful reminder of the giantess's movements, of her sheer, overwhelming presence. A blinding light pierced the darkness as the giant lips parted. I squinted, my eyes struggling to adjust after so long in the dark. As my vision cleared, I saw something that made my BLD run cold a massive, blue silicone object, its head slowly entering my prison. My mind raced with fear and disbelief. The object, now unmistakably a DLD, moved deeper into the El Canal, its size was incomprehensible, its presence a horrifying testament to my new reality. I could see every detail of its surface, the silicone shining wetly in the dim light filtering through the giantess's legs. With nowhere to run, I began to scramble, trying to avoid the encroaching object, but the walls around me were too slick, and my tiny limbs couldn't find purchase. The DLD continued its inexorable advance, pushing me further into the depths of the giantess's body. Panic surged through me as the DLD's head loomed ever closer. My attempts to flee were in vain, the cavernous space left me no room to maneuver. As the object reached me, I felt myself being pressed against its surface, the silicone cool and unyielding. I was stuck, unable to free myself from the powerful suction of the lubricated walls and the pressure of the DLD. With a sickening jolt, the DLD was pushed in fully, and I found myself trapped on its head, carried along for the ride as it moved in and out. Each move was a jarring, overwhelming experience, the world around me a blur of motion and sensation the walls of the closed in around the DLD, pressing me against it with every movement. I screamed, but no sound escaped. My cries were swallowed by the giantess's body, my struggles insignificant against the relentless rhythm of the DLD's motion. Each move pushed me deeper, then pulled me back, a never-ending cycle of pressure and release. My mind was a maelstrom of fear, desperation, and helplessness. The reality of my situation was beyond anything I had ever imagined. I thought of my friends, my dreams of becoming the greatest hero, and how far I had fallen from that path. Trapped inside the body of a giantess, subjected to forces beyond my control, I felt utterly alone. The DLD continued its relentless assault, each move a reminder of my insignificance. The giantess, unaware of my presence, was lost in her own pleasure, her movements becoming more forceful and erratic. My body was battered, my mind struggling to cope with the overwhelming sensations. As the move grew more powerful, I could feel my body beginning to give out. Each impact sent waves of agony through me, the force crushing me against the unyielding silicone. My vision blurred, my thoughts growing hazy. The rhythm of the DLD's movements was relentless, each move pushing me closer to the edge. The walls of the closed and tighter, the pressure building with each movement. My bones ached, my muscles screamed in protest. I knew I couldn't withstand much more. The realization hit me like a blow, I was going to die here, inside the body of a giantess, crushed by an unfeeling object. With one final, powerful move, the DLD drove deep into the giantess's body, 
and I felt my bones crack under the pressure. The pain was excruciating, my screams silent and futile. My vision went black, my body convulsing in its death throes. The last thing I felt was the overwhelming pressure, the crushing force that finally brought an end to my suffering. The world went dark, my consciousness fading as my body was shattered. The giantess, unaware of the tiny life she had ended, continued in her pleasure, her movements a grim echo of my final moments. I was gone, lost in the depths of her body, my dreams and hopes extinguished in the darkness. I've always dreamed of being a hero. With all might as my inspiration, I've worked tirelessly, even without a quirk, to one day become someone who saves others with a smile. That all changed when I discovered my unique ability, a quirk that allowed me to shrink myself and others down to a mere inch tall. Initially, it seemed like a bizarre and somewhat useless power for a hero, but I soon realized how versatile it could be. One warm afternoon, I found myself lounging in the common area of Yua High's dorms, enjoying the rare quiet moment. The sun streamed through the large windows, casting a warm, golden light over the furniture. I was lost in thought, my mind wandering over the possibilities my quirk presented, when I heard a familiar voice calling my name. Ochako, I said, turning to see her bright face beaming at me. Her energy was infectious, and I couldn't help but smile back. Hey, Deku, I've got a fun idea. Are you up for it? She asked, her eyes sparkling with excitement. She was wearing a pair of tight pink leggings that clung to her form making her look more athletic than usual. The color complemented her bubbly personality perfectly. Curiosity peaked, I nodded eagerly. Sure, what do you have in mind? She giggled and leaned in closer, her voice dropping to a conspiratorial whisper. I want you to shrink down for me. I've got something really fun planned. My heart skipped a beat at her request. Though we often used our quirks for training and practical jokes, this seemed different. There was an intensity in her eyes that made me both excited and nervous. Okay, I'll do it, I replied, trying to mask my anticipation with a calm exterior. I activated my quirk, and within moments, the world around me grew enormous. Achako's smile widened as she gently picked me up, her fingers surprisingly gentle for their size. She carried me to her room, each step she took feeling like a minor earthquake to my tiny form. The air was filled with her scent a mix of floral shampoo and a hint of sweat from training. My heart raced with a mix of excitement and anxiety as she set me down on her bed, the soft fabric feeling like a vast plain beneath me. Now, wait here for a moment, she said with a wink before leaving the room. As I stood on her bed, the sheer scale of everything was overwhelming. The bedspread was a landscape of hills and valleys, and the ceiling seemed impossibly high. I couldn't help but marvel at how different the world looked from this perspective. A few moments later, Ochako returned, and to my surprise, Katsuki Bakugo was with her, his expression was one of confusion mixed with curiosity. What's this all about, Yuraka? he demanded, his usual gruffness tempered by intrigue. Just a little fun, Kekin, she replied, her voice sweet but with an underlying edge. Now, Deku, I need you to trust me, okay? I nodded, my tiny form trembling slightly with anticipation. Ochako turned and bent over the bed, her pink leggings stretching taut over her curves. The sight was mesmerizing, and I felt a flush rise to my cheeks. Kaken, place him on my butt, she instructed, her voice taking on a commanding tone that left no room for argument. Bakugo hesitated for a moment before complying, his massive hand reaching down to pick me up. The sensation of being lifted by him was both terrifying and exhilarating. He carefully placed me on the smooth, fabric-covered surface of Ochako's rear, and I found myself looking up at a wall of pink. Before I could fully process the situation, Ochako's voice came again, softer this time, but with a lecherous edge that sent shivers down my spine. Now, Kaken, jerk off and aim your CCK so when you come, it sprays all over Izuku and my butt. Bakugo's eyes widened in shock, but there was a flicker of excitement in them as well. You're serious, he asked, his voice husky with a mix of disbelief and arousal. Absolutely, Ochako replied, her tone brooking no argument. She glanced back at me, her eyes filled with a mischievous glint. Just relax and enjoy the ride, Deku. I could see the determination in his eyes, a mixture of curiosity and arsel that mirrored my own conflicting emotions. As he unzipped his breathe, the sound was deafening to my tiny ears, like the unzipping of a massive tent. His giant members sprang free, already stiff and imposing, casting a shadow over me. From my position, the sheer scale of Bakugo's CCK was overwhelming, each vein and curve seemed monumental, a testament to his raw masculinity. I watched, spellbound, as he wrapped his hand around the thick, his fingers tightening with a mixture of force and precision. Bakugo began to himself, his hand moving up and down with a rhythm that was almost hypnotic. 
The sounds of his heavy breathing and the slick movement of his hand filled the air, creating an atmosphere charged with raw energy. Each brought him closer to the edge, and I could feel the tension building, both in him and in the space around us. Ochako's body shifted slightly beneath me, her own arsel evident in the subtle movements of her hips. The fabric of her leggings pressed gently against my back, a constant reminder of my position. I clung to the material, my eyes never leaving Bakugo's towering form. As Bakugo's pace quickened, the atmosphere grew more intense. His breaths came in ragged gasps, his muscles tensing with each. The sight was both mesmerizing and intimidating, a powerful display of primal longing. I could see the beads of sweat forming on his forehead, his eyes half-closed in concentration. Then, with a guttural groan, Bakugo reached his CLMX. The world seemed to slow as he came, the first jet of hot, sticky cum shooting from his CCK with incredible force. It arced through the air, a massive wave of white that seemed almost otherworldly from my tiny perspective. The first splash hit me squarely, knocking me back slightly and covering me in warmth and stickiness. The subsequent bursts of cum followed, each one coating both me and Ochako's but in a thick layer of his essence. The sensation was overwhelming, the sheer volume and heat of it engulfing my tiny form. I could feel the weight of it, the sticky substance clinging to my skin and the fabric beneath me, creating a bond that held me fast. Ochako let out a soft, satisfied mon, her body shivering with the intensity of the moment. The vibrations traveled through her flesh and into me, adding another layer to the already overwhelming experience. She gently patted her butt, the light pressure making the cum spread even more, sticking me firmly to her leggings. As Bakugo stepped back, breathed heavily, I was left glued to Ochako's butt, my tiny body covered in his cum. The air was thick with the scent of arsal and sweat, a heady mix that left me dazed and exhilarated. From this strange and NTMT vantage point, I felt a connection to both of them that was deeper and more complex than anything I had experienced before. Ochako let out a soft mon, her body shivering with pleasure. Perfect, she whispered, her voice filled with satisfaction. She reached back and gently patted her butt, the light pressure sending ripples through the fabric and making my position even more precarious. Bakugo stepped back, breathed heavily, a smug grin spreading across his face. Well, that was something, he said, his voice tinged with a mixture of surprise and satisfaction. Achako carefully lifted me off her butt, her fingers surprisingly gentle as she peeled me away from the sticky surface. She held me up to her face, her eyes filled with a mix of amusement and affection. How was that, Deku, she asked, her tone soft and caring. I took a deep breath, my tiny heart still racing from the intensity of the experience. It was, intense, I admitted, unable to hide the tremor in my voice. She giggled, her laughter a comforting sound that made me feel safe despite the strange situation. I'm glad you enjoyed it, she said, her smile warm and genuine. You're amazing, Dikyu. Always up for anything. Bakugo snorted, crossing his arms over his chest. Yeah, well, don't get too used to it, Deku. You're still a nerd, he said, but there was a hint of respect in his voice that hadn't been there before. As the adrenaline began to fade, I found myself reflecting on the experience. It had been unexpected and intense, pushing the boundaries of my comfort zone in ways I hadn't anticipated. But it had also brought me closer to Ochako and even to Bakugo, forging new connections in the most unusual of circumstances. In that moment, I realized that being a hero wasn't just about fighting villains or saving lives. It was also about understanding and embracing the complexities of human relationships, no matter how strange or unconventional they might be. And in that sense, I felt more like a hero than ever before. I often wonder what life could have been if things were different. If I wasn't born into a world where my size determined my worth, where every day was a fight for survival, and every shadow a potential threat. But here I am, Izuku Midoriya, just another tiny person among thousands, bred and raised for the amusement of the giants that rule our world. The breeding farm was the only home I had ever known. From as far back as I can remember, it was a place of cold metal and harsh light, where the air always smelled of antiseptic and fear. The cages were small, just large enough to stand and turn around in, and stacked high in rows that seemed to go on forever. Each cage held a tiny person, a potential product waiting to be sold. Our caretaker, a giant with a face like a stone, would come by each morning and peer into our cages with a look of indifference. We were numbers to him, not individuals. He would pluck some of us from our cages, examining us like one would a piece of fruit, checking for flaws or defects. Those deemed unfit were never seen again. One morning, it was my turn. The caretaker's massive hand reached into my cage, the bars bending slightly under the pressure of his grip. I was lifted into the air, my stomach churning with a mix of fear and hope. He scrutinized me with his cold, calculating eyes, then nodded in satisfaction. 
I had been chosen, but for what fate, I could only guess. That day, a group of us were gathered together for the first time. It was the first time I saw others up close, their faces reflecting my own mix of dread and uncertainty. We were all given a quick, rough bath, the cold water making us shiver. Then we were crammed into a plastic container with small air holes punched through the lid. There was barely enough room to move, and the air grew stifling with our combined breath. The container was placed into a dark, cardboard box. The lid closed with a finality that sent a shiver down my spine. We were plunged into complete darkness, the only sounds the muffled sobs of the others and the occasional creak of the box as it was moved. Time lost all meaning in that darkness. Minutes stretched into hours, or perhaps it was days. We could only wait and wonder what awaited us on the other side. After what felt like an eternity, the box was jostled roughly, sending us tumbling into one another. The movement stopped, and we heard the sound of tape being cut, the ripping noise loud in the oppressive silence. Light. Flooded in as the box was opened, blinding us after so long in the dark. A giant face peered down at us, its expression one of mild curiosity. Fresh shipment, the giant muttered, reaching in to lift our container. We were placed on a cold, metal surface, and the lid was removed. Blinking against the sudden brightness, I took in my surroundings. We were on a shelf, surrounded by rows of other containers, each holding tiny people like us. The air was filled with the hum of fluorescent lights and the distant murmur of voices. The store was a strange, overwhelming place. Giants walked past, glancing at the containers with varying degrees of interest. Some would stop and peer inside, their eyes filled with a mix of curiosity and indifference. We were products on display, our lives reduced to commodities to be bought and sold. As the hours passed, the initial shock began to wear off, replaced by a grim acceptance. This was our reality now. We had been taken from the farm and placed here to be sold. Our futures were uncertain, our fates resting in the hands of those who saw us as little more than toys. I looked around at my fellow captives, their faces reflecting the same mix of fear and resignation. Among them was a girl with bright eyes and a determined expression, standing out from the sea of despair. She caught my gaze and offered a small, encouraging smile. It was a small gesture, but it sparked a glimmer of hope within me. The store's lights dimmed, signaling the end of the day. As darkness settled in, I couldn't shake the feeling that our journey was only just beginning. The next day, the store was abuzz with activity. Giants moved through the aisles like living mountains, their immense bodies creating gusts of wind that ruffled the air holes in our container. Each giant was a force of nature, their footsteps sending faint vibrations through the shelf on which we sat. I watched with growing dread as one after another, these colossal beings would pick up our container, peer inside with idle curiosity, and then set us back down with a dismissive glance when they saw the price tag. As the hours dragged on, a sense of hopelessness settled over me. Each giant face that loomed above us seemed more indifferent than the last. It wasn't until near the end of the day that a woman with short, spiky blonde hair stopped in front of our shelf. Her gaze was sharp and inquisitive, and when she picked up our container, I felt a chill run down my spine. Her eyes scanned over us with a predatory interest, lingering on each of our tiny forms. Inko is going to be in for a surprise tonight, she murmured with a smile, her words sending a jolt of fear through me. Without another word, she placed our container into her cart and continued shopping, her movements confident and unhurried. The checkout process was a blur of overwhelming sensations. The beeping of the scanner, the rustle of bags, and the low hum of conversations all blended into a cacophony that made my head spin. Our container was jostled roughly as it was scanned, the barcode beneath us identifying us as mere merchandise. Then, with a finality that made my heart sink, we were dropped into the dark confines of the woman's purse. The journey in the purse was a chaotic mix of darkness and motion. We were tossed around with each step she took, the jarring movements making it impossible to find any sense of stability. My fellow captives clung to each other, their faces pale with fear. In the suffocating blackness, we were all reduced to the same helpless state, our fates now entirely out of our hands. After what felt like an eternity, the world around us finally came to a stop. A blinding light pierced the darkness as the purse was opened, and we were unceremoniously dumped onto a strong surface. I blinked rapidly, trying to adjust to the sudden brightness. As my vision cleared, I found myself looking up at the face of another giant a woman with vibrant green hair and wide, surprised eyes. Oh Mitsuki, you shouldn't have, the green-haired woman said, her voice a mix of surprise and delight. Happy birthday, Inko, replied Mitsuki, the blonde woman who had purchased us. There was a mischievous glint in her eyes as she popped the lid off our container, her massive fingers deftly working the small clasps that held it shut. The lid was removed with a soft click, and we were exposed to the open air. I took in my surroundings with a sense of growing dread. 
We were on a vast, wooden expanse of coffee table, its surface cluttered with various snacks and dips. The scale of everything around us was overwhelming. What to them were simple party foods were, to us, towering mountains and vast pools. Inko's green eyes peered down at us with a mix of curiosity and amusement. They're so tiny, she remarked, her voice a low rumble that vibrated through the air. She reached out, and her enormous fingers descended towards us, each one as thick as my entire body. I flinched instinctively, my heart PND in my chest. Mitsuki laughed softly. Go ahead, pick one up. They're surprisingly durable. I watched in horror as Inko's fingers wrapped around one of my fellow captives, a young girl who had been huddled close to me. The girl let out a tiny scream, her limbs flailing helplessly as she was lifted into the air. Inko held her up to her face, inspecting her with a kind of detached interest. She's cute, Inko said, her breath washing over the girl in a warm, overpowering gust. The girl squirmed, her tiny cries barely audible over the giant's conversation. Mitsuki nodded. They make great conversation pieces. Just imagine the fun you could have at parties. I felt a cold sweat break out over my body. To them, we were nothing more than entertainment, living toys to be played with at their whim. The sheer power disparity was staggering. Each of their casual movements could spell life or death for us, and they seemed utterly oblivious to the terror they inspired. As the evening wore on, we were left on the coffee table, surrounded by the remnants of Inko's birthday celebration. The giants chatted and laughed, their voices booming like distant thunder. Occasionally, one of them would reach for a snack, their hands passing dangerously close to our container. Each time, I held my breath, praying that we would be overlooked. But luck was not on our side. At one point, Mitsuki reached for a bowl of chips, her hand brushing against our container and sending it skidding a few inches across the table. We tumbled inside, the impact jarring and disorienting. When we came to a stop, I found myself pressed against the transparent wall, my heart racing. Oops, Mitsuki said with a chuckle. Forgot they were there. Inko laughed too. With little care in her voice, she said, Sorry, little ones. We'll be more careful. Her words did little to comfort me. The casual way they treated us, the complete disregard for our safety and dignity, was a stark reminder of our place in this world. We were nothing more than curiosities, and our lives were at the mercy of these giants. The true horror began when the giants decided to sample us as if we were just another delicacy. Mitsuki's hand reached down, her fingers closing around a young man who had been standing next to me. He struggled, his tiny limbs flailing, but it was no use. She dipped him into a bowl of creamy dip, his screams muffled by the thick substance, and then raised him to her mouth. I watched in abject horror as her lips parted, revealing rows of teeth as larger than my entire body. With a casual flick of her wrist, she tossed the tiny man into her mouth. There was a brief, muffled scream, and then silence. Mitsuki chewed thoughtfully, a look of mild interest on her face. Inko followed suit, picking up a terrified woman and dipping her into a glass of wine. The woman's cries were drowned out as she was submerged, and then lifted to Inko's lips. The giant woman's tongue flicked out, tasting the wine-soaked woman before she was drawn into the cavernous mouth. Inko's eyes closed in apparent enjoyment as she swallowed, her throat working visibly as the woman disappeared. One by one, my fellow captives were taken. Each time, the giants would comment on the taste, comparing us to different snacks and delicacies. Some were dipped in chip dip, ranch dressing, and even a spicy salsa that caused them to writhe in pain before being consumed. It was a nightmarish banquet, and we were the main course. I tried to keep my composure, to stay hidden among the remnants of our container, but it was impossible. The giants were methodical, ensuring that none of us were overlooked. Finally, it was just me left, trembling and alone in the plastic prison. Inko's hand descended, her fingers closing around my body with a grip that left me no room to move. She lifted me into the air, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. Time for the last one, she said, her voice sending a shiver down my spine. She dipped me into the chip dip, the cold, thick substance clinging to my body. The smell was overwhelming, and I struggled to breathe. As she lifted me towards her mouth, my heart PND so strong I thought it might burst. I could see every detail of her lips, the slight sheen of saliva, the faint lines and creases. Her mouth opened, revealing the dark cavern within. Just as I thought it was the end, I slipped from her fingers. The dip made me slick, and I fell, tumbling through the air. I landed with a soft thud, not on the strong surface of the table, but in a warm, soft valley. I looked up, dazed, to find myself nestled between Inko's breasts. Mitsuki giggled, her massive face filling my vision. You made a mess, Inko, she teased, leaning in. I watched in horrified fascination as her tongue extended, a massive, pink muscle that swept down and licked the dip from Inko's skin. 
I was caught up in the motion, dragged along by the force of it. Then, before I could react, Mitsuki's lips closed around me. I was drawn into her mouth, the warmth and moisture overwhelming. Her tongue moved me around, coating me in saliva, before she leaned in and embraced Inko deeply. I was passed between their mouths, the sensation disorienting and terrifying. I could hear the muffled sounds of their laughter, feel the vibrations of their pleasure as they played with me like a toy. Finally, I was deposited into Inko's mouth. The last sight I had was Mitsuki's giant face pulling away with a satisfied smile. Inko's tongue moved me around, tasting me, before she tilted her head back. I felt a sudden pressure, and then I was sliding down her throat, the muscles contracting around me in a rhythmic motion. It was dark, wet, and suffocating, the air filled with the sounds of her body. And then, there was nothing. Life at Yua University had a rhythm a rhythm set to the beat of training sessions, classes, and the occasional off the wall antics from my friends. I'd grown accustomed to the quirks, both literal and figurative, of my classmates, but nothing could have prepared me for the events of that fateful day. My quirk, unique in its own right, allowed me to shrink down to just one inch tall. It was a peculiar power, often more useful in stealth missions and reconnaissance than in direct combat. I could also shrink others, though this aspect of my ability was rarely used. Despite its unconventional nature, I'd learned to HRNSS it effectively. Little did I know, I was about to test its limits in ways I never imagined. The afternoon sun bathed the campus in a warm, golden glow as I strolled towards the training grounds. My mind wandered through the details of my latest hero analysis, a habit that kept me constantly engaged and alert. It was then that Kayoka Gyro approached me, her expression a mix of curiosity and something else something mischievous. Hey, Midoriya, she called, her voice carrying a playful undertone. Got a minute? I nodded, intrigued. Sure, Kayoka. What's up? She twirled one of her earphone jacks around her finger, a habitual gesture that indicated she was deep in thought. I have a fun idea. It involves your quirk. Think you could shrink yourself down for a bit. Her request was unusual, but my curiosity got the better of me. Okay, I guess. What do you have in mind? She flashed a mysterious smile. You'll see. Just trust me. In a quiet, secluded corner of the campus, I focused on activating my quirk. The world around me expanded as I shrank down to an inch tall. From this perspective, everything was monumental. The blades of grass towered above me, swaying gently in the breeze, and Kayoka's face loomed like a colossal landscape, her features magnified and intense. She bent down and scooped me up carefully, her fingers surprisingly gentle despite their size. Each step she took was a minor earthquake, the vibrations reverberating through my tiny body. My heart raced with a mixture of excitement and apprehension. What could she possibly have planned? Kayoka's room, once familiar, now appeared vast and intimidating. She set me down on her desk, her smile both reassuring and enigmatic. Just wait here for a moment, she said, before leaving the room. Moments later, the door opened again, and Shoto Todoroki stepped inside. My heart skipped a beat as I saw him completely naked, his lean, muscular frame exposed. His normally stoic expression was replaced with a hint of uncertainty. What's going on, Kayoka? I called up, my voice tiny and squeaky in comparison to their giant forms. Kayoka returned, her eyes gleaming with mischief. Midoriya, I thought we could have some fun. Before I could fully comprehend her words, she gently picked me up and placed me on the head of Shoto's irked member. The warmth radiating from his skin was intense, and the sensation of being so small, so vulnerable, was overwhelming. Kayoka knelt down, her giant eyes now level with me. Her gaze was a mix of playful and predatory, sending shivers down my spine. Hope you survive this, Midoriya, she said casually, her voice echoing in my tiny ears. Time seemed to slow as Kayoka's enormous mouth opened, her lips parting to reveal her tongue and teeth. Horror gripped me as I realized her intention. She was going to take Shoto into her mouth with me along for the ride. Desperation fueled my movements as I sprinted towards the base of Shoto's member, my tiny legs pumping furiously. The distance felt insurmountable, like running a marathon. But Kayoka's mouth closed around the head before I could make much progress. Darkness enveloped me, and I clung to the huge member for dear life. The sensation of Kayoka's tongue gliding over me was surreal and terrifying. The slick, warm muscle pressed me against Shoto's member, adhering me to his skin. Each movement of her tongue felt like a tidal wave, pushing and pulling me with its force. The heat inside her mouth was stifling, and the humid air was thick with the scent of Shoto's arsal. My mind raced, trying to find a way out of this predicament. The rhythmic motions of her SCK created a dizzying cycle of pressure and release, making it difficult to think clearly. As the intensity of the situation grew, I focused on my breathing, trying to remain calm. 
The sensation of Shoto's pulse throbbing through the massive organ was a stark reminder of the precariousness of my position. Each heartbeat was a powerful, rhythmic drum, echoing through my tiny body. Kayoka's tongue continued its relentless assault, coating me in saliva and making it impossible to maintain a firm grip. I slid along the length of Shoto's member, the frictionless surface offering no refuge. The relentless motion of her mouth threatened to overwhelm me, pushing me closer to the edge of despair. As the act continued, I found myself gradually pushed towards the slit at the head of Shoto's member. The pressure built around me, and I knew what was coming. When Shoto finally reached his CLMX, the force of his release propelled me forward with a violent surge. I was launched out directly into Kayoka's waiting mouth, landing on her tongue with a disorienting thud. The slick surface was a stark contrast to the rigid member I had just been clinging to. I looked up through Kayoka's mouth to see Shoto's flushed, exhausted face peering down at me, a mixture of concern and regret in his eyes. Before I could gather my thoughts or attempt to escape, Kayoka's tongue moved again, guiding me towards the back of her throat. Panic surged through me as I realized what was about to happen. The powerful muscles contracted around me, drawing me deeper into the dark, humid tunnel. Each swallow brought me further down her esophagus, the rhythmic contractions pressing me from all sides. The heat was oppressive, and the lack of air made it difficult to breathe. I could feel the powerful muscles working to move me along, and I fought against the urge to panic. Darkness surrounded me as I slid further down her throat. My mind raced through the events that led me here, replaying each moment with startling clarity. Trust, friendship, and the unexpected consequences of our quirks. My world had changed in ways I couldn't have anticipated, and I was left to navigate this new reality. The campus of UA University was bustling with life. The transition from high school to university meant we had more freedom, but also greater responsibilities. The air was filled with the sounds of chatter, laughter, and the occasional explosion from the training grounds. I was heading towards the faculty building, my mind occupied with thoughts of my latest training session. My quirk, which allowed me to shrink down to one inch tall, was a unique one but it had its challenges and advantages. As I walked, I couldn't help but think about the endless possibilities my quirk offered. I had been training rigorously, learning to control my shrinking ability with precision. The other students often wondered what it was like to be so small, and some of the teachers had interesting ideas on how I could use my quirk effectively in combat and rescue missions. I was snapped out of my thoughts by a familiar voice calling my name. Midoriya, I turned to see Midnight, the arated hero, and one of our more unconventional teachers. Her presence always commanded attention, and today was no different. She had a mischievous glint in her eyes that made me slightly uneasy. Good afternoon, Midnight Sensei, I greeted her respectfully. Good afternoon, Midoriya. I have a special request for you. Are you up for a little experiment? She asked, her tone playful yet intriguing. I hesitated for a moment, wondering what she had in mind. Midnight was known for her unconventional teaching methods and ideas. What kind of experiment? I asked cautiously. She leaned in closer, her eyes sparkling with excitement. I want you to shrink down to your smallest size. Trust me, it'll be fun, she said, her voice almost a whisper. Curiosity got the better of me, and I nodded. All right, sensei. I trust you. With that, I activated my quirk and felt the familiar sensation of my body shrinking. The world around me grew larger, and soon, I was standing at a mere inch tall on the ground. Midnight's towering form loomed over me, her eyes wide with fascination. She carefully scooped me up in her hand and held me close to her face. Perfect, she murmured, her breath warm against my tiny body. Now, let's go somewhere more private. Midnight carried me through the halls of the faculty building, her steps light and graceful. I felt a mix of excitement and nervousness, wondering what she had planned. Eventually, we arrived at her private quarters. She closed the door behind her and set me down on her desk. As I looked around, everything seemed enormous from my perspective. The room was dimly lit, with soft light casting shadows on the walls. Midnight sat down on the chair, her eyes never leaving me. I have a special surprise for you, Midoriya, she said, her voice dripping with anticipation. Before I could ask what she meant, the door to the adjoining room opened, and to my shock, All Might stepped in. He was naked, his muscular form towering over everything. My eyes widened in disbelief and confusion. All Might, I squeaked, my voice barely audible at my tiny size. All Might didn't respond. Instead, he stood still, his face stoic yet slightly flushed. Midnight turned to him and gave a nod. We're ready, she said. She then turned her attention back to me, her eyes gleaming with excitement. She picked up a condom from the desk and carefully placed me inside the end of it. Being inside the condom was a surreal experience. The LTX walls surrounded me, creating a tight and confining space. 
I could see Midnight's giant eyes peering down at me through the translucent material. I hope you have fun, Midoriya, she said in a suggestive manner. Panic set in as I watched her kneel down and put the condom on All Might's irked member. The world became a blur of motion as she pulled the condom over him, and I found myself pressed against the end of it. The heat and pressure were overwhelming, and I could barely move. All Might's massive form loomed above me, and I could feel his heart PND through the LTX. Midnight stood up and began to undress, her movements slow and deliberate. The reality of my situation hit me like a freight train. This was not some harmless experiment, this was something far more intense and terrifying. I barely had a moment to process what was happening before Midnight positioned herself over All Might and dropped down onto him. The sudden movement caused the condom to tighten around me, and I was squished against All Might's member. The rhythmic motion of their bodies created an intense and suffocating environment. Each move was a wave of pressure that left me gasping for breath. Time lost all meaning as the ordeal continued. Minutes felt like hours, and hours felt like an eternity. The constant motion and pressure were relentless. I tried to keep my mind focused, but it was nearly impossible. All I could do was endure and hope that it would end soon. Each move felt like a powerful earthquake, jostling me around inside the tight confines of the condom. The heat was unbearable, and the sensation of being squished against All Might's flesh made it difficult to breathe. My thoughts raced, oscillating between fear and a desperate hope that this would end soon. Eventually, I felt a shift in the rhythm, and All Might's movements became more urgent. With a final, powerful move, he CLMX, and I was sprayed with his seed inside the tight condom. The pressure eased slightly, but I was still trapped in the confining space. Midnight let out a satisfied sigh and slowly peeled the condom off All Might. I felt the world tilt as she tied the end of the condom in a knot and carelessly tossed it into the garbage bin. The realization that I was still inside hit me like a punch to the gut. As I lay in the bottom of the garbage bin, covered in All Might's fluids and surrounded by discarded items, I felt a wave of despair wash over me. Midnight had forgotten about me in her post-bliss state, leaving me trapped and alone. The smell was overwhelming, and the darkness pressed in from all sides. I tried to think of a way out, but my mind was clouded with exhaustion and fear. The answer heroic figure of All Might was now a distant memory, replaced by the harsh reality of my situation. I was just a tiny, insignificant speck in a world that had suddenly become too big and too dangerous. Hours passed, and I began to lose hope. The bin was cold and unforgiving, and I could feel my strength waning. I wondered if anyone would ever find me, or if I would be left here, forgotten and alone. The thought was almost too much to bear. The smell of the garbage was overpowering. The LTX condom I was trapped in was slick and sticky, and I could barely move. My muscles ached, and my mind was clouded with exhaustion and despair. I could hear muffled sounds from outside the bin, but none of them were close enough to offer any hope of rescue. The darkness of the garbage bin was a stark contrast to the bright, hopeful world I had known just hours before. As the hours dragged on, I found myself reflecting on my life and my choices. I had always wanted to be a hero, to save others and make a difference. But now, I was the one who needed saving, and it seemed that no one would come. The isolation was maddening. I replayed the events of the night over and over in my mind, trying to make sense of how things had gone so wrong. Midnight had been so confident and persuasive, and I had trusted her. But that trust had led me to this dark, lonely place. I thought about my friends and how they would react if they knew what had happened. Would they search for me? Would they even realize I was missing? The thought of my friends gave me a glimmer of hope but it was quickly overshadowed by the reality of my situation. The cold seeped into my bones, and I shivered uncontrollably. My body was exhausted, and I felt my strength slipping away. I wondered if I would ever see the light of day again, or if I would remain trapped in this dark, smelly bin forever. The thought was too much to bear, and I felt tears welling up in my eyes. As the hours turned into what felt like days, I began to accept my fate. I was alone, forgotten, and helpless. The answer heroic dreams I had held on to for so long seemed distant and unattainable. My quirk, which had always been a source of pride and excitement, now felt like a curse. I thought about my mother and how worried she would be when she realized I was missing. The thought of her pain was almost too much to bear. I wanted to tell her that I was okay, that I would find a way out of this, but the reality was that I was trapped, and there was no way out. I closed my eyes and tried to focus on the positive memories I had. The times I had spent with my friends, the moments of triumph and victory, the support and encouragement I had received from my teachers. These memories gave me a small measure of comfort, but they also made my current situation all the more painful. Izuku. My quirk has always been a bit of a wild card. The ability to shrink down to an inch tall and take others along with me seemed useful in theory, but practical applications were limited. 
Today, however, Ochako had a strange request. Her big, brown eyes were practically begging us as she stood before me and Katsuki, hands clasped together, a hopeful smile on her face. Please, Izuku, Katsuki, can you shrink down? It's for a training exercise, she said, her tone almost pleading. I glanced at Katsuki, who was frowning but seemed intrigued. He and I exchanged a silent conversation, a mixture of confusion and curiosity, but ultimately, we agreed. All right, I said, nodding to Ochako. Katsuki huffed but gave his assent with a grumble. With a deep breath, I activated my quirk. The world around us ooned into a dizzying expanse as we shrank down to mere inches tall. Ochako's towering form bent down, her hand reaching out to gently pick us up. The sensation of being lifted by her enormous fingers was unsettling yet somehow thrilling. She placed us in the pocket of her skirt, and with every step she took, we were tossed around, the fabric walls around us shifting and swaying. The world outside was a blur of motion and muffled sounds, her footsteps reverberating like distant thunder. After what felt like an eternity, Achako's giant fingers reached into her pocket and carefully lifted us out. We found ourselves on her nightstand, the surface stretching out like a vast plain. Stay here, she commanded softly, before turning and walking to her closet. Katsuki. What the hell is going on? I thought as I struggled to maintain my balance on the nightstand. Izuku and I were in the pocket of Ochako's skirt for what felt like an eternity. Each step she took was like a minor earthquake, tossing us around like ragdolls. Now, we were finally out in the open again, but it didn't feel any better. Ochako walked back to us, holding something in her hands. Her face was flushed, a strange look in her eyes. She placed the object between us with a thud, causing us to stumble and fall on our butts. The thing loomed over us like a tower. I squinted at it, trying to make sense of what it was. A silicone object, purple in color. Before I could process anything, Achako's massive fingers grabbed us again. There was a sense of finality in the way she handled us, her grip firm but not painful. Then, I saw it the glue. Panic flared up inside me as she applied it to our backs, sticking us to opposite sides of the head of the silicone object. What the hell, Achako, I yelled, but my voice was nothing more than a squeak to her. She didn't seem to hear me. She laid down on her bed, holding the object in her hand, her eyes half-closed, her breath coming in shallow gasps. Ochako. The idea had been gnawing at me for days, a mixture of curiosity and something else. When I saw Izuku and Katsuki together, I knew I had to ask them. They were the only ones I trusted with this. I had no idea how they'd react, but their compliance was a relief. As I carried them in my pocket, I felt a thrill run through me. The power, the control it was intoxicating. When I placed them on my nightstand and went to my closet, I could barely contain my excitement. My hands trembled as I picked up the purple object, my heart racing. When I returned, I saw the confusion and fear in their tiny faces, but I couldn't stop now. I glued them to the object, their tiny bodies stuck in place, and laid down on my bed. The silicone toy felt cool in my hands, a stark contrast to the heat building within me. With a deep breath, I brought it to my, my face flushed with anticipation. I began to move it, move it rhythmically, my breath coming in short gasps. The sensation was overwhelming, the combination of the toy and the knowledge of what I had done filling me with a heady mix of power and pleasure. Izuku. I could hardly believe what was happening. Achako's massive face loomed above us, her eyes half-lidded, her breath hot and heavy. She then brought the silicone object to her now giant, and we were moving into a world of darkness and heat. Her lips enveloped us, the motion of the toy carrying us in and out of her body in a relentless rhythm. Hours seemed to pass in a blur of sensation. The heat, the movement, the overwhelming sense of powerlessness, it was all-consuming. I tried to hold on, tried to keep my bearings, but it was impossible. The world was reduced to the sensations around me, the relentless move, the sound of Ochako's breath, the feel of her skin. Finally, it ended. Ochako lay still, spent, her breath coming in ragged gasps. She dropped the toy onto the floor beside her bed, and I was left staring up at the ceiling, my mind struggling to process what had just happened. Katsuki. I couldn't believe this was happening. The sensation of being move in and out of Ochako's was like nothing I had ever experienced. The heat, the moisture, the sheer power of her movements, it was overwhelming. I tried to yell, tried to get her attention, but it was useless. My voice was lost in the chaos, drowned out by the sound of her breathing and the movement of the toy. When it finally ended, I felt a strange mix of relief and frustration. Ochako dropped the toy onto the floor, and I was left staring up at the ceiling, my body aching from the ordeal. What the hell just happened, I muttered, my voice hoarse. But there was no answer, only the sound of Ochako's breathing, slowing as she drifted off to sleep. Ochako. As the waves of pleasure subsided, 
I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me. The toy, with Izuku and Katsuki still attached, lay forgotten on the floor. I knew I should pick it up, take care of them, but exhaustion weighed me down. My eyes fluttered closed, and I drifted off to sleep, a small smile playing on my lips. When I woke, the room was filled with the soft light of dawn. I stretched, my body sore but content. Then, the events of the previous night came rushing back, and I bolted upright, looking around frantically. There, on the floor beside my bed, lay the toy, with Izuku and Katsuki still stuck to it. Guilt washed over me. What had I done? I quickly picked up the toy, carefully peeling them off and setting them on the nightstand. They were still unconscious, their tiny bodies battered and bruised. Tears pricked at my eyes as I realized the extent of my actions. I'm so sorry, I whispered, my voice choked with regret. I could only hope that they would forgive me. The morning light filtered through the curtains, casting a warm glow across the room. I woke up, feeling the remnants of guilt from last night weighing heavily on me. I glanced over at the floor where Izuku and Katsuki lay, still glued to the purple toy. My heart sank as the events of the previous night came rushing back. I couldn't face them. The embarrassment was too much. With a heavy sigh, I gently picked up the toy, with them still attached, and placed it into the drawer of my nightstand. I closed it carefully, shutting them away in the darkness. I needed to get dressed and clear my mind. Izuku. The darkness was all-consuming. Katsuki and I lay there, still glued to the toy, every muscle aching from the ordeal. Time seemed to stretch endlessly in the confined space of the drawer. I had no idea how long we had been there, but it felt like hours. Suddenly, light flooded in as the drawer was opened. Before I could even adjust, a giant hand reached in, grabbing the object we were attached to. The voice that followed sent a shiver down my spine. Ochako won't mind if I borrow this, the voice boomed. Our world became a blur of motion as we were carried away. The hand holding us was pink, and as we finally managed to focus, we realized it was Mina. She had no idea we were here. Katsuki. Dear minute. Of all people, why Mina? I thought, struggling to keep my bearings as the world spun around us. Mina's hand gripped the toy, her cheerful, oblivious demeanor only adding to the horror of our situation. She carried us into her room and laid down on her bed, her massive form looming above us. Panic surged through me as she positioned the object at the entrance to her mouth. Mina. The toy felt cool in my hand as I lay down on my bed. Ochako had such interesting things, and I couldn't resist borrowing this one. As I lay down on my bed, anticipation coursed through me. The toy felt cool and smooth in my hand, and I couldn't resist taking my time to savor the experience. I brought it close to my face, holding it near my lips, my eyes half open and filled with a hungry longing. The purple head gleamed invitingly in the light. For a few moments, I just stared at it, letting my imagination run wild with the sensations it promised. Then, with a slow, deliberate motion, I placed the head just inside my mouth. The cool silicone felt refreshing against my lips and tongue. I began to lick it, slowly and sensually, as if it were a popsicle. Each lick sent a shiver down my spine, heightening my arsenal and anticipation. I closed my eyes, losing myself in the sensation, and allowed the pleasure to build before moving on. Izuku. I struggled to adjust, my body still aching from the previous ordeal. Mina's face now loomed above us, her eyes half open and filled with a predatory hunger. Panic surged through me as I watched her bring the toy, with us still attached, up to her face. Her breath washed over us, warm and sweet. She stared at the head of the toy for a few moments, her expression one of anticipation and longing. Then, with a slow, deliberate motion, she placed the head just inside her mouth. The sensation of her giant tongue lick the toy was both surreal and terrifying. I felt the pressure and moisture as she lick it like a popsicle, savoring each moment. The experience was disorienting and overwhelming. The world was reduced to the heat and wetness of her mouth, the rhythmic motion of her tongue sending. Waves of pressure through my tiny body. I glanced over at Katsuki, who looked just as horrified as I felt. There was nothing we could do but endure. Katsuki. My heart raced as I watched her bring the toy up to her face. Her breath washed over us, warm and humid, as she stared at the head of the toy with half-open, hungry eyes. The expression on her face sent a chill down my spine. Then, with a slow, deliberate motion, she placed the head just inside her mouth. The sensation of her tongue lick the toy was indescribable. It was like being caught in a storm, the pressure and moisture overwhelming my senses. I could feel every lick, every movement of her tongue, as she savored the toy like a popsicle. This can't be happening, I thought, trying to keep my wits about me. I glanced over in the direction of Izuku, who probably looked just as stunned and horrified. We were completely powerless, at the mercy of Mina's whims, and all we could do was endure this new nightmare. Izuku. 
The heat was unbearable. Mina's movements were relentless, each move sending waves of pressure through my tiny body. I could feel Katsuki on the opposite side, our shared predicament adding to the surreal horror of the situation. We were powerless, completely at the mercy of Mina's whims. Mina. The sensation of the toy in my mouth was incredible, but I needed more. I slowly removed it from my lips, savoring the last taste before bringing it down to my entrance. The anticipation was electric, my body tingling with longing. With a slow, deliberate motion, I positioned the head of the toy and began to push it inside. The cool silicone contrasted deliciously with the heat of my body. I gasped at the sensation, my breath hitching as I started to pump the toy in and out. Izuku. As Mina pulled the toy from her mouth, the world around us shifted again. The warm, humid air of her breath was replaced by the sweltering heat emanating from her body. I barely had time to register our new position before she started to push the toy inside herself. The first move was disorienting. The pressure and heat were overwhelming, each movement sending waves of sensation through my tiny body. Mina's pace was relentless, and the rhythmic pumping seemed to go on forever. Time lost all meaning as we were carried along by her motions, our world reduced to the pulsing, throbbing tunnel of her. Katsuki. Diamene, Mina, I thought, feeling the relentless rhythm of her move. Each movement was a powerful, overwhelming force that left me reeling. The heat, the pressure, the motion it was all too much. I tried to brace myself, but there was no escape from the relentless PND. Hours seemed to pass in this nightmarish cycle. The world was a blur of heat and motion, and all I could do was endure. Mina's movements became more erratic, the pressure increasing with each move until, finally, she slowed and pulled the toy out. Mina. The waves of pleasure crashed over me, leaving me breathless and trembling. I pulled the toy out, feeling the slickness of my juices covering it. Exhaustion weighed me down, making it impossible to even consider putting the toy back in its place. I let it slip from my hand, hearing it thud softly against the floor beside my bed. I lay there, too spent to move, my eyes fluttering closed as sleep claimed me. Izuku. The sudden stillness was almost as disorienting as the motion had been. Mina's breathing slowed, and the toy was dropped unceremoniously to the floor. The impact was jarring, but at least we were no longer being move about. I lay there, my body aching and exhausted, too tired to even consider moving. Katsuki was beside me, equally spent. The heat of Mina's body still lingered around us, a reminder of the ordeal we had just endured. We need to. Find a way out, I whispered, but my voice was weak, and I wasn't sure if Katsuki could hear me over the sound of Mina's breathing. Katsuki. I heard Izuku's voice, faint and exhausted, but I couldn't muster the energy to respond. The heat, the pressure, the relentless motion it had drained me completely. I lay there, my body aching and my mind numb from the experience. Later, I muttered, though I wasn't sure if Izuku could hear me. We'll figure it out later. For now, all I could do was lie there, gathering what little strength I had left, and wait for a chance to escape this nightmare. The world around us seemed impossibly vast and indifferent, and for now, all we could do was endure. Izuku. The world at one inch tall was a breathtaking expanse of wonders and terrors. My quirk, Minnie might, let me explore this miniature universe, and today I wandered through the grassy patch behind Yua University. Each blade of grass loomed over me like a towering tree, the dewdrops glistening like jewels in the morning sun. I'd informed Momo of my plans, knowing she always worried about me. She had fashioned a tiny tracker to keep tabs on my location, just in case. Today, however, trouble found me before she did. While examining a particularly appealing dewdrop, I heard a rustling sound. Turning around, I saw them fire ants, enormous from my perspective, their mandibles clicking menacingly as they closed in. My heart PND as I started to run, the ground beneath me feeling like shifting sand. The ants were relentless. I zigzagged through the grass, but they were faster, their legs carrying them swiftly over the terrain. I stumbled over a pebble, which to me was the size of a boulder, and found myself cornered. The ants advanced, their eyes reflecting the morning light. Then, a shadow loomed over me. The ground shook as a giant shoe came down, squashing the ants with a deafening crunch. Dirt and debris flew everywhere, and I was sent tumbling backward, my world spinning chaotically. As I tried to gather my bearings, another massive impact rattled the ground. Looking up, I saw Momo. Her enormous form was a blend of concern and determination, her face scanning the ground for me. From my perspective, she was a towering colossus, her movements causing tremors that rippled through the earth. I was frozen with fear. Despite knowing she was here to help, her immense size and power overwhelmed me. Momo's giant fingers descended without warning, pinching me between them with surprising force. I felt my stomach drop as I was lifted rapidly into the air, the ground disappearing beneath me. 
Momo. The tracker led me to the grassy area behind the university. My heart raced as I saw the fire ants swarming. Without hesitation, I stomped on them, feeling a mixture of disgust and relief. I had to find Izuku quickly. Scanning the ground, I finally spotted him tiny and fragile, lying among the dirt and debris. My concern for his safety overrode everything else. I reached down, pinching him firmly between my fingers and lifting him up without a second thought. I needed to make sure he was okay. Are you alright? I asked, my voice low but firm. I brought him closer to my face, trying to examine him for any signs of injury. His tiny form trembled slightly, and I realized he must be terrified. I hadn't meant to frighten him, but my focus was on ensuring his safety. As I held him between my fingers, I noticed how his tiny body was tense, his eyes wide with fear. I tried to be as gentle as possible, but the urgency of the situation made it difficult. Izuku didn't respond immediately, his tiny chest heaving with rapid breaths. I frowned, worried that he might be in shock. Izuku, it's me, Momo. Are you hurt? I tried to soften my tone, hoping to calm him down. Seeing he was still in shock, I decided to keep him safe in a more secure manner. Without asking for his input, I placed him gently between my breasts. Using my quirk, I created a small HRNSS that strapped him securely to my chest. I felt his tiny form press against me, and I hoped the warmth and closeness would comfort him. Izuku. The sensation of being lifted by Momo's fingers was terrifying. From my perspective, her fingers were like massive tree trunks, squeezing me with an alarming force. My heart raced as I ascended rapidly, the ground becoming a distant blur. Momo's voice rumbled around me, a low but powerful sound. Are you all right? She asked, her breath washing over me like a gust of wind. I was too scared to answer immediately, my body shaking uncontrollably. She brought me closer to her face, her immense eyes scrutinizing me with concern. Her proximity was overwhelming, and I felt completely vulnerable. Despite knowing she meant well, the sheer size difference made every movement she made seem like a potential threat. Izuku, it's me, Momo. Are you hurt? Her voice was softer this time, but still, the power behind it was unmistakable. I struggled to find my voice, the words caught in my throat. And no, I'm not hurt, I finally managed to stammer. Just. Shaken up. Her fingers shifted slightly, adjusting her grip. Even that minor movement felt monumental to me, sending a jolt of fear through my body. I tried to focus on her face, reminding myself that she was my friend and only wanted to help. Without any warning, she moved me closer to her chest. My surroundings changed rapidly as she placed me between her breasts. The warmth and softness of her skin were overwhelming, and before I could react, I felt a HRNSS materialize around me, securing me firmly in place. The pressure of being strapped against her was intense. As she began to walk, I was caught up in the sway of her movements. Each step caused her breasts to shift slightly from side to side, and I found myself being gently rocked and pressed by the rhythmic motion. My heart pned as I tried to adjust to this new situation, the sensation both disorienting and oddly comforting. Momo's heartbeat thudded in my ears, a steady reminder of her enormous presence. Momo. Feeling Izuku secure against my chest, I hoped the closeness would provide him with a sense of safety. His tiny form nestled between my breasts seemed vulnerable, but the HRNSS created by my quirk would ensure he stayed in place. Okay, let's get you somewhere safe, I said softly, trying to soothe him. As I started walking back towards the university, I felt the need to address his reckless behavior. Izuku, you can't keep putting yourself in danger like this, I lightly scolded him, my voice firm yet gentle. It's not just about your adventures. You have to consider the risks and the people who care about you. Each step I took was as smooth as possible to avoid jostling him. Once inside, I headed to a quiet room and sat down carefully. With gentle hands, I removed the HRNSS and lifted him from his secure spot, placing him back on the table. His tiny form still trembled, but at least he was safe. Take a moment to catch your breath, I suggested, sitting down across from him. You're safe now. Izuku. As Momo placed me on the table, I felt a mix of relief and lingering fear. The stable surface was a welcome change from the intense pressure of being secured against her chest. I took a few deep breaths, trying to calm my racing heart. Thank you, Momo, I said, my voice still a bit shaky. I appreciate it. She smiled, but her towering presence was still intimidating. Anytime, Izuku. But you need to be more careful. The world is a lot more dangerous at this size. I nodded, knowing she was right. I will. I promise. Despite her kind words, Momo's sheer size and serious expression were overwhelming. Her eyes, the size of billboards to me, scrutinized every inch of my tiny form. The intensity of her gaze made me feel small and exposed. Momo. 
Seeing Izuku's tiny form on the table, I couldn't shake my worry, he had a tendency to get into dangerous situations, and I needed to be firm about his safety. Izuku, I began, my tone serious, I appreciate your adventurous spirit, but you have to understand how dangerous it is for you at this size. If you don't start being more careful, I will have to teach you a lesson about safety. My voice, though meant to be gentle, boomed around him like thunder. I noticed him flinch slightly, his tiny form trembling. His wide eyes reflected a mix of concern and curiosity. To make sure you understand how serious I am, I continued, using my quirk to create a small, see-through container with air holes. I might have to confine you to this if you keep putting yourself in danger. I placed the container on the table next to him with a solid thud. The sound reverberated through the table, and Izuku stumbled, looking up at the towering walls of the container. Izuku. The sight of the container sent a shiver down my spine. It was just large enough for me to stand and move around a bit, but its presence was imposing. The clear walls and air holes made it look like a tiny prison, a stark reminder of the consequences of my actions. Momo, I... I began, my voice barely above a whisper. I understand. I'm really sorry for worrying you. Her eyes, still filled with concern, seemed to bore into me. I just want you to be safe, Izuku. You mean a lot to me, and I can't bear the thought of something happening to you. I nodded, feeling a deep sense of guilt. I promise I'll be more careful. I didn't realize how much my actions affected you. Momo's serious expression didn't waver. I'm glad to hear that. Just remember, if you ever put yourself in danger like this again, I'll have to use this container to keep you safe. Her fingers, large and looming, pointed to the container. The movement, though slow, was unnerving. Each finger was the size of a tree trunk to me, and the implied threat of the container was clear. The weight of Momo's words settled over me, and I felt a renewed commitment to being more cautious. The tiny container on the table was a constant reminder of the consequences I could face if I continued to act recklessly. Momo, I promise I'll do better, I said earnestly. I'll think things through and consider the risks before I act. She nodded, a faint smile breaking through her serious demeanor. That's all I ask, Izuku. I just want you to be safe and to think about the people who care about you. With that, we continued our conversation, the atmosphere lightening, but with an undercurrent of seriousness. Momo's unwavering support and concern for my well-being were clear, and I was determined to live up to her expectations. The tiny container remained on my desk as a constant reminder of Momo's expectations and my commitment to being more careful. It symbolized not just a potential punishment, but also the depth of her care and concern for me. Izuku. The sun was setting, casting a golden hue over Musutafu as I made my way through the bustling streets. My mind was preoccupied with the list of groceries my mom had given me, and I barely noticed the people around me as I moved from store to store. The city was alive with energy, the hum of conversation blending with the distant roar of traffic. I found a sense of calm in the familiarity of the routine, the normalcy of everyday tasks providing a stark contrast to the chaos that often defined my life as a hero in training. I was lost in thought, wondering if I had remembered to pick up everything on the list, when a flash of pink caught my eye. I turned my head to see Mina Ishido, one of my classmates from UA, standing by a storefront. She wasn't alone, though. There was an odd intensity to her gaze, as if she was wrestling with a decision. Her usual bubbly demeanor was replaced by something more subdued, almost troubled. Hey, Mina, I called out, waving to get her attention. She turned to face me, and for a moment, a shadow of a smile crossed her lips before it disappeared. Izuku, she said, her voice tinged with uncertainty. I need your help. Can you follow me? Her request was unexpected, but there was a sincerity in her eyes that made me nod without hesitation. Sure, what's going on? Mina didn't answer immediately. Instead, she turned and began walking briskly, her movements almost mechanical. I quickened my pace to keep up. My curiosity peaked and a slight sense of unease beginning to stir in my chest. She led me down a series of winding streets, the buildings around us growing taller and casting long shadows as the sun dipped lower in the sky. Mina, where are we going? I asked, trying to mask the nervousness creeping into my voice. She glanced back at me, her expression unreadable. Just trust me, Izuku, she said softly, and then she turned a corner, disappearing from sight. I broke into a jog, not wanting to lose her in the maze of alleyways. When I rounded the corner, I was met with an empty alley. Panic flared in my chest as I scanned the area, my heart pnd. Where did she go? I ventured further into the alley, the air growing cooler and the light dimmer. My foot landed in something wet, and I looked down to see a puddle of grayish goo. My breath hitched, and I recognized it immediately this was Mina's acid. My mind raced, piecing together the possibilities, but before I could make sense of it, a glint of metal caught my eye. 
Instinct kicked in, and I jumped back just in time to avoid a knife that embedded itself in the ground where I had been standing. I looked up, my pulse quickening as I saw a shadowy figure emerging from the depths of the alley. Himiko Toga. Disguises were always fun, and today had been particularly entertaining. Slipping into Mina's form had been easy, her bubbly personality a stark contrast to my own, making it all the more thrilling. Watching Izuku follow me, his trust shining in those green eyes, gave me a rush of excitement. He had no idea what awaited him. Leading him through the streets, I maintained Mina's brisk, purposeful pace, ensuring he couldn't keep up too easily. Every time he called out to me, I felt a strange sense of power. Here was Deku, the hero I admired and obsessed over, following me like a lost puppy. As I turned the corner into the alley, I let Mina's form melt away, my true self emerging in the dim light. I knew he would follow, and I couldn't wait to see the look on his face when he realized the trap he had walked into. I heard his footsteps, hesitant at first, then quickening as he came around the corner. I slipped into the shadows, watching with glee as he stopped, confusion and concern playing across his features. When he stepped into the puddle of goo, I couldn't help but smirk. The knife throw was a warning, a little game to heighten his senses. I watched him jump back, eyes wide with realization. Deku, oh Deku, I called out, my voice sweet and mocking as I stepped into the light. His reaction was everything I had hoped for shock, recognition, and fear. I'm so happy you came. Izuku. The alley seemed to close in around me as Toga stepped into the light. My breath caught in my throat, her presence sending a shiver down my spine. Deku, oh Deku, she crooned, her voice sweet and mocking. I'm so happy you came. I took a step back, my mind racing for a strategy, but before I could react, she was upon me. Her movements were almost too fast to follow, and I felt a sharp pain in my arm as she stabbed me with a syringe. The world tilted, my vision blurring as the sedative took hold. My legs gave out, and I fell forward, barely catching myself on my hands and knees. Don't worry, Deku, Toga whispered, her voice distant as darkness closed in. You'll be safe with me. Her laughter echoed in my ears as I slipped into unconsciousness, my last thoughts a jumble of confusion and fear. Himiko Toga. Watching Izuku collapse was like watching a beautifully choreographed dance come to its CLMX. His body hit the ground with a satisfying thud, and I couldn't help but giggle with delight. All that power, all that potential, now lying helpless at my feet. Sleep tight, my sweet Deku, I whispered, crouching down to brush a strand of hair from his face. There was something almost tender in the gesture, a mockery of affection that made the whole scene even more twisted. The alley was silent save for the distant hum of the city, the perfect backdrop for this NTMT moment. I knew the others would be waiting, but I lingered for a moment longer, savoring the victory. After a few moments as I stood over Izuku's unconscious body, an amazing sight unfolded before my eyes. His form began to shimmer and shrink, his limbs retracting and his body compressing until he was no larger than two inches. I watched in silent fascination, the corners of my lips twitching upwards in delight. The transformation was unexpected but not unwelcome. It made things so much easier. Kneeling down, I gently picked him up, cradling his tiny form in my hands. He looked so delicate, so vulnerable, and the sight filled me with a twisted sense of affection. Oh, Deku, I murmured, my voice a soft whisper in the quiet alley. You're even cuter like this. I slipped him into the pocket of my coat with extreme care, making sure he was securely tucked away. His small body nestled against the fabric, and I felt a surge of possessiveness. He was mine now, completely at my mercy. Giggling to myself, I patted the pocket gently, savoring the moment. Don't worry, Deku, I whispered. You'll be safe with me. With that, I turned and walked away, the night closing in around us as I carried my precious cargo into the shadows. Izuku. I woke up enveloped in darkness, my senses sluggish and my body heavy with an unfamiliar lethargy. The air around me was musty, tinged with the scent of old wood and something metallic. I could tell I was trapped in some kind of enclosed space, the walls pressing in on me from all sides. The floor beneath me was strong and uneven, and the faint sound of my own breathing was the only noise in the oppressive silence. I tried to feel around, my hands brushing against the smooth, cool surface of what felt like wooden walls. There was no obvious door, no escape. Frustration and fear gnawed at me as I stumbled through the darkness, my fingers tracing the contours of my prison. The objects I encountered as I moved were strange, their textures unfamiliar. Some were soft and pliable, like RBB, while others were strong and cold. I tripped more than once, cursing under my breath as I picked myself up, only to stumble again. My attempts to navigate the space proved futile, and eventually, I gave up, sinking to the ground with my back against one of the weird-feeling objects. Time passed slowly in the darkness. Without any way to measure it, each minute felt like an hour, 
and each hour like an eternity. I closed my eyes, trying to calm my racing thoughts, but the uncertainty of my situation made it impossible to rest. Every sound, every shift in the air, set my nerves on edge. Suddenly, the silence was shattered by a series of thunderous bangs. They reverberated through my confined space, growing louder and closer with each impact. My heart pned in my chest as the noise approached, a cacophony of sound that filled me with dread. The bangs stopped abruptly, and before I could react, I was flung forward, landing strong on my face. Blinding light flooded my vision as the drawer I was in opened, the sudden brightness making me squint and shield my eyes. As I struggled to get my bearings, a giant hand reached in and grabbed me. The sensation was overwhelming, my body dwarfed by the massive fingers that encircled me. I was lifted out of the drawer, the world around me spinning as I was brought face to face with Toga. Her eyes were half-closed, a look of gleeful satisfaction on her face as she regarded me. Good morning, Deku, she purred, her voice a mix of sweetness and malice. She held me up, inspecting me like a prized possession, her breath warm and sweet against my tiny form. Himiko Toga. Holding tiny Izuku in my hand was a thrill like no other. His small, helpless form brought me immense joy, a twisted sense of affection that made my heart race. His wide eyes were filled with confusion and fear, making the moment even sweeter. Deku, I whispered, my voice dripping with excitement. You look so adorable like this. I couldn't help but giggle as I brought him closer to my face, my eyes drinking in every detail of his miniature form. His tiny limbs, his expressive eyes, everything about him was perfect. I imagined all the fun we could have together, and a shiver of anticipation ran down my spine. Just then, the door to the room opened, and Dabai walked in. He raised an eyebrow at the sight of me holding Izuku, a smirk playing at the corners of his lips. Are you ready, dearie? I asked, my voice taking on a sing-song quality. Dabai's expression remained impassive as he moved to the bed and lay down, his eyes never leaving mine. Always, he replied, his tone as dry as ever. Excitement bubbled up inside me as I turned my attention back to Izuku. His tiny body trembled in my hand, his fear palpable and intoxicating. With a gentle yet firm grip, I brought him lower, towards Dabai's irked member. Izuku's eyes widened in horror as he realized what was happening. No, please, he begged, his voice a tiny squeak against the overwhelming silence of the room. But his pleas only fueled my excitement. I carefully positioned him, placing him in the hole of Dabai's member. The sensation must have been overwhelming for him, but I was too caught up in the thrill of the moment to care. With Izuku in place, I disrobed, my movements slow and deliberate. The anticipation was almost too much to bear, my heart pnd in my chest. I positioned myself over Dabai, my body looming over Izuku like a monstrous entity. His tiny form was almost lost against the vast expanse of my skin. And then, with a final, breathless moment of anticipation, I lowered myself onto Dabai's member, enveloping both him and the tiny Izuku within me. The sensation was indescribable, a mix of power, pleasure, and possessiveness that left me breathless. Izuku. The darkness was thick and oppressive, pressing in from all sides as I found myself trapped in a horrifyingly NTMT situation. The realization of where I was and what was happening made my BLD run cold. The air was stifling, the heat almost unbearable, and I could barely move within the confines of Dabai's member. I was completely at the mercy of Toga's twisted longing. Through the dim light filtering in from above, I saw Toga's massive form looming over me. Her body seemed to fill the entire space, her skin a landscape of smooth, pale flesh that extended infinitely above me. Her face, partially obscured by the shadows, wore an expression of ecstatic anticipation. Her eyes half-lidded and glinting with a sadistic joy. Her lips parted in a breathy sigh, and I could hear her heartbeat, a rhythmic thudding that reverberated through the space around me. As she positioned herself above Dabai, her body cast a looming shadow over me, her thighs creating a cavernous darkness. The heat radiating from her was palpable, a suffocating wave that made it strong to breathe. I could see every detail, every curve and line, as she descended slowly, her movements deliberate and controlled. My heart pnd in my chest, each beat echoing the thunderous sounds from outside. I felt like a speck, insignificant and powerless, as Toga's giant form closed in. The space around me grew tighter, the pressure increasing as she lowered herself onto Dabai's member, enveloping me in a living, breathing prison of flesh. Her moans and gasps filled the air, a haunting symphony of pleasure that contrasted sharply with my terror. I tried to scream, to call out for help, but my voice was swallowed by the overwhelming sensation of being engulfed. The walls around me pulsed with each movement, each breath she took, adding to the disorienting and claustrophobic experience. As Toga's body pressed down, I was lost in the suffocating darkness, her warmth and pressure becoming my entire world. 
Every shift and movement was a reminder of my helplessness, my tiny form utterly consumed by the monstrous, living landscape that was Toga and Dabai. The last thing I saw before everything went black was Toga's face, her eyes gleaming with unrestrained delight, her lips curved into a triumphant smile. Her whispered words echoed in my mind as consciousness slipped away, leaving me to the mercy of the living nightmare. Time had lost all meaning. The relentless motion of Toga's body, the suffocating heat, and the overwhelming pressure made it impossible to think clearly. I felt every move, every movement, as she rode Dabai with a manic intensity that seemed to stretch on forever. My tiny form was battered and jostled within the confines of Dabai's member, every second a fresh wave of terror and helplessness. I could hear their voices, muffled and distorted, as they spoke above me. Dabai's voice, rough and breathless, broke through the rhythmic PND. Toga, I'm just about finished. Her response was a sultry whisper, dripping with excitement. Get ready with a good move, dearie. I barely had time to process her words before I felt the shift, the sudden tightening as Dabai prepared for his final move. The world around me seemed to compress and then explode in a blinding rush of motion and heat. The force of the move sent me flying like a bullet, propelled by a torrent of white goo. I was hurled through the slick, dark passage, tumbling uncontrollably. The sensation was dizzying, the world a blur of motion and heat. I tried to brace myself, but the force was too great, and I was carried along by the relentless tide of Esamin. Himeko Toga. The sensation was indescribable. As Dabai's final move propelled him deep inside me, I felt the rush of warmth and the incredible pressure as he released. My plan was coming to fruition, and the thought filled me with a twisted sense of triumph. I could feel the tiny form of Izuku as he was carried along by the force of Dabai's CLMX, hurtling deep inside me. The sensation was both exhilarating and surreal, my body reacting to the intense STMLTN as my plan unfolded perfectly. Izuku. I continued to be propelled deeper, the tight, warm walls closing in around me. The pressure was immense, and I was barely able to keep myself oriented as I was pushed along. Finally, the force began to abate, and I found myself slowing down, the passage widening slightly until I was deposited into a larger, more spacious cavity. I was disoriented and gasping for breath, my body battered and aching. As I struggled to regain my bearings, I realized where I was. The realization was horrifying Toga's womb. I had been pushed all the way inside her reproductive system, carried along with Dabai's SMN. In the dim, warm darkness, I could feel something moving, something wriggling and alive. I managed to grab onto it, my fingers curling around the slippery form. It was one of the SPRM, a wriggling, desperate creature seeking out the egg. The horror of the situation hit me anew as I was carried along by the SPRM, deeper into the womb. I screamed, my voice lost in the oppressive darkness, as I saw the giant egg looming ahead. The SPRM, driven by an instinctive force, pushed forward relentlessly, and I was unable to break free from its grip. Together, we hit the egg, the impact sending a shockwave through my body. The membrane of the egg enveloped us, the world outside becoming a blur as we were absorbed into its gelatinous interior. I felt the strange, alien sensation of being fused with the SPRM, our forms melding together as the egg began the process of fertilization. My consciousness flickered, overwhelmed by the biological processes taking place. Himiko Toga. Weeks passed in a blur of anticipation and excitement. I could feel the changes in my body, the subtle shifts and signs that my plan had succeeded. I reveled in the sensation, the knowledge that Izuku was now a part of me in the most NTMT way possible. One morning, I stood in front of the mirror, my hand resting on my slightly swollen abdomen. The curve of my stomach was a clear indication of my PRG and CY, the result of the night's twisted culmination. I smiled, a satisfied, almost maternal expression on my face. Soon, Deku, I whispered to my reflection, my eyes gleaming with triumph. You'll be with me forever. The weight of my secret filled me with a sense of power and satisfaction. I caressed my belly gently, feeling the life growing inside me, the product of my dark and twisted love. Every movement, every sensation, was a reminder of my triumph and the promise of what was to come. Quick note. As my writing improves I am going to go back to my old chapters and edit them so if you see an update but no new chapter it's just me editing previous chapters. I apologize for any inconvenience you will receive. Walking through the bustling streets of Musatafu, I felt the warm afternoon sun on my face and the lively hum of city life around me. The days at UA University were intense, filled with rigorous training and challenging classes, but moments like these simple, peaceful, and ordinary were a rare respite. I was on my way to meet my friends for our weekly catch-up. Laughter, camaraderie, and a break from our heroic duties awaited. My thoughts drifted to what Bakugo might say this time, or if Todoroki had found a new hobby to surprise us with. 
As I navigated through the crowd, my mind occupied, I suddenly collided with someone. The impact was unexpected, sending a slight jolt through me. Oh, I'm so sore, I began to apologize, turning around to face the person I had bumped into. My words faltered as my vision blurred. The last thing I saw before everything went black was a woman standing in front of me, a smirk playing on her lips. My consciousness slowly flickered back to life, and as I opened my eyes, I was immediately struck by a sense of disorientation. The world around me was enormous, surreal, and dreamlike. I took a few moments to gather myself, trying to understand what had happened. The surface beneath me was smooth and expansive, stretching out seemingly forever. It was a table, but not just any table a giant one. The scale was mind-boggling. I pushed myself up to my feet, my legs trembling, and surveyed my surroundings more closely. Scattered across the vast expanse were colossal makeup items, a lipstick tube that towered like a skysker, powder compacts the size of small buildings, and brushes that looked like giant trees with bristles fanned out like a dense forest. A magnifying glass was attached to the edge of the table, its frame thick and imposing, resembling some sort of futuristic apparatus designed for scrutinizing tiny worlds. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my racing heart. It didn't take long for me to realize that I had shrunk. Based on the relative size of everything around me, I estimated my height to be about five or six inches. The realization sent a wave of panic through me. How had this happened? Where was I? As my mind raced with questions, I heard the distant sound of a door creaking open. The noise echoed, followed by the rhythmic thudding of footsteps, each one causing the table beneath me to tremble. My heart pnd as the footsteps grew louder and closer. A woman entered the room, her presence overwhelming. She was enormous, her figure looming over the table with an almost casual menace. In her hand, she held what looked like a toolbox, but to me, it was the size of a small building. She sauntered over to the table and sat down, her movements causing the surface to quiver. I fell onto my butt from the tremors, my fear paralyzing me. She looked down at me, her giant eyes cold and calculating. For a moment, we just stared at each other, and then she spoke. Her voice was chilling, devoid of warmth. Here's what's going to happen, little man, I am going to dress you up, and you are going to stay still while I work. Or else. As she spoke, she slammed a pair of scissors into the table next to me. The blades embedded themselves deeply into the wood, sending splinters flying. The message was clear. Do you understand, she asked, her tone icy. I swallowed strong and nodded as quickly as I could, my mind racing with fear and confusion. What did she want with me? Good. You're just lucky that you have green hair, she said, a cruel smile curling on her lips. She opened the toolbox, revealing a collection of outfits female outfits. The giant woman's cold eyes bore into me, and though fear gripped my heart, there was no time to process it fully. She moved with a precision and speed that belied her size, her giant hand descending upon me with the swiftness of a hawk snatching its prey. Her fingers wrapped around my tiny form, lifting me effortlessly off the table. I felt like a mere doll in her grasp, utterly powerless. She placed me down directly in front of her, closer to the edge of the table. The towering makeup items loomed behind me like a bizarre, oversized landscape. The tabletop seemed even more expansive from this vantage point, stretching out in every direction, a vast, intimidating expanse. Her attention shifted momentarily as she began to rummage through the toolbox, the clinking and clattering of its contents echoing like thunder in my tiny ears. I watched, heart pnd, as she sifted through various items, her movements deliberate and meticulous. The anticipation was unbearable, each passing second feeling like an eternity. Finally, she pulled out a piece of clothing and placed it on the table in front of me. It was unmistakably a sailor Neptune uniform, complete with the sailor collar, pleated skirt, and bows. The sight of it filled me with confusion and dread. What was she planning? Why this outfit? Change into it, she commanded, her voice a chilling monotone. My mind reeled, trying to process the absurdity of the situation. I glanced up at her, searching for any hint of mercy or understanding, but her expression remained cold and implacable. The giant pair of scissors embedded in the table served as a stark reminder of the consequences if I disobeyed. Trembling, I reached out and touched the uniform. The fabric felt smooth and cool under my fingers, its size proportionate to my shrunken form. With no other choice, I began to undress, my hands shaking as I removed my clothes and donned the sailor Neptune uniform. The skirt swished around my legs, the sailor collar resting heavily on my shoulders. I felt a wave of humiliation and helplessness wash over me, but there was no escape from this nightmare. As soon as I had changed, she leaned in closer, her massive face filling my vision. She adjusted a magnifying glass that was attached to the table, bringing it closer to inspect her handiwork. 
the lens distorted her already enormous features, making her eyes appear even larger and more intimidating. She scrutinized me with a meticulousness that made my skin crawl. Without warning, she reached into the toolbox again and pulled out various makeup items. Her giant hands moved with surprising dexterity as she began to apply makeup to my face. Each brush felt like an invasion, the bristles coarse against my skin. She applied foundation, blush, eyeshadow, and lipstick with a precision that was both impressive and terrifying. The process felt like it lasted hours, though it was probably only minutes. Her concentration was absolute, her movements steady and unyielding. I could see the satisfaction in her eyes as she transformed me, reshaping my appearance to suit her twisted vision. She attached hair extensions, their weight pulling at my scalp. Her attention then shifted to my body. She produced small bits of paper towel, carefully folding and shaping them. With deft movements, she tucked the makeshift padding into the Sailor Neptune uniform, creating the illusion of a generous bust. The paper towel pressed against my chest, adding to the discomfort and humiliation of my situation. She continued to adjust my figure, her fingers pinching and prodding to ensure I had the feminine curves she desired. Each adjustment felt like a violation, my body no longer my own. The fabric of the uniform was tight against the added padding, the sensation alien and constricting. When she finally finished, she leaned back, admiring her work. Her hand moved to a nearby mirror, one designed for her size but impossibly huge for me. She held it up so I could see my reflection. I stared in shock and disbelief. The person looking back at me was unrecognizable. I looked exactly like Sailor Neptune, the transformation complete and disturbingly thorough. My heart sank further as I realized how meticulous her work had been. Every detail was perfect, down to the last hair strand and makeup line. Perfect, she murmured, more to herself than to me. Her voice was softer now, almost pleased, but it did nothing to lessen the fear coursing through me. She set the mirror aside and looked down at me again, her eyes glinting with a mixture of satisfaction and anticipation. Whatever her plans were, they were far from over. I stood there, a tiny hero trapped in a grotesque parody, wondering how I could possibly escape this living nightmare. Her satisfaction was palpable, and as she leaned back, a smile crept onto her lips. It was a smile devoid of warmth, a predator's smile. I could feel the weight of her gaze, the cold calculation in her eyes. The table, the makeup, the uniform all of it was part of a game, a game in which I was nothing more than a pawn. The air was thick with tension, the silence between us heavy and oppressive. My mind raced, desperate for a way out, a plan, anything. But all I could do was stand there, waiting for whatever came next, trapped in a world where I was impossibly small, and she held all the power. As I looked up at her, the enormity of my predicament settled over me like a suffocating shroud. This was only the beginning, and the road ahead was filled with uncertainty and fear. But deep within, a spark of determination flickered. I was Izuku Midoriya, and no matter how dire the circumstances, I would find a way to fight back. Once the transformation was complete, she leaned back and admired her handiwork with a satisfied smirk. The silence in the room was almost deafening, broken only by the faint rustling of her movements. I was left standing there, feeling more helpless than I ever had in my life. My mind raced with questions, but I was snapped back to reality as she moved with a sudden purpose. She reached below the table, her movements deliberate and confident. My heart pned as I watched her rummage through whatever was hidden beneath the surface. When she emerged, she held a large plastic container in her hands. It looked eerily familiar, like the kind of packaging used for action figures and dolls a plastic shell with a cardboard backing and four white cords that I knew were used to secure the items in place. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. She intended to encase me like a toy. Without a word, she lifted me again, her grip firm but not painful. I could feel the immense power in her fingers, the ease with which she handled me. She placed me on the cardboard backing, positioning me carefully on my back. The surface was rough against the fabric of the Sailor Neptune uniform, and the sheer absurdity of the situation made my head spin. Before I could react, she grabbed the first white cord and looped it around my right wrist. The material was surprisingly strong and unyielding, digging into my skin as she tied it securely. I tugged against it instinctively, but my efforts were futile. She repeated the process with my left wrist, then my ankles, each movement precise and practiced. The cords pulled my limbs tight, stretching me out in a starfish-like pose. I tried to squirm, but the bindings held fast. The sensation was a strange mix of discomfort and vulnerability, my body completely immobilized against the cardboard. She stepped back for a moment, her eyes scanning my form with a clinical detachment. I could see the satisfaction in her gaze, the pleasure she took in her work. Her next move was to lift the plastic cover, a clear, molded shell that would encase me entirely. My breath quickened as she positioned it over me, the reality of my entrapment sinking in. 
The plastic pressed down, molding perfectly to the contours of my body. It was like being trapped in a transparent coffin, every inch of my form visible yet completely inaccessible. The sound of her applying glue echoed around me, each press and squeeze sealing me further into my prison. As the adhesive set, the plastic bonded to the cardboard, securing me within. I strained against the cords and the unyielding plastic, but my efforts were useless. I was trapped, a living doll encased in a display box. She lifted the container, tilting it so that she could inspect her work from various angles. Her face loomed large through the clear plastic, her eyes bright with a perverse delight. The world outside my plastic prison was distorted and magnified, making her appear even more monstrous. The finality of my entrapment settled over me like a suffocating blanket as she completed the last touches. She leaned forward, her face filling the limited view I had through the tiny air holes in the plastic casing. Her eyes gleamed with a twisted delight, her breath fogging up the plastic ever so slightly as she spoke. You are going to make a customer very happy, you know, she said, her voice dripping with satisfaction. Her words struck me with a sense of dread and helplessness. Customer? The realization that she intended to sell me, like some collectible figure, sent a shiver down my spine. Before I could fully process the horror of my situation, she reached out and lifted the plastic container. The world around me tilted and shifted, the sensation disorienting and terrifying. The plastic walls amplified every sound the rustling of her clothes, the clinking of objects as she moved. She carried me over to a shipping box, a plain cardboard container that loomed large in my limited vision. With a practiced efficiency, she placed the plastic casing containing me into the box. The cardboard walls rose around me, casting me into shadows. The air felt thicker, the scent of cardboard mingling with the faint chemical smell of the plastic. I could see her face one last time as she peered into the box, a final smirk playing on her lips. The expression was one of triumph, of satisfaction in her twisted work. Her eyes lingered on me for a moment, savoring the sight of my helpless form encased and ready for shipment. Then, with a swift and decisive movement, she closed the box, plunging me into near-total darkness. I heard the sound of tape being torn from its roll, each strip sealing my fate further. The adhesive pressed down, muffling any sounds from outside and trapping me within this small, suffocating space. The weight of the situation pressed heavily upon me, the reality of my helplessness hitting me in waves. The darkness was nearly complete, save for a few slivers of light that seeped through the seams of the box. I could feel the confines of the plastic casing pressing against me, restricting my movements and making each breath shallow and laborious. The air was stuffy and stale, the tiny air holes barely providing enough to keep me from panicking. Suddenly, I felt the box being lifted. The movement was abrupt and jarring, tossing me slightly within my confines. The sounds of the outside world were muffled, reduced to vague vibrations and distant echoes. The sensation of being carried was disorienting, each step the woman took sending tremors through the box. I tried to brace myself, but there was little I could do to mitigate the jostling. I felt the box tilt again, a sensation of descent that made my stomach lurch. The noise of doors opening and closing, the hum of what I assumed was a vehicle's engine starting, reached me in muted vibrations. The realization that I was being transported somewhere, that my fate now lay in the hands of an unknown customer, filled me with a deep, gnawing dread. As the vehicle began to move, the gentle rocking motion made it clear that I was on a journey to an uncertain destination. My mind raced with questions and fears. Who was this customer? What did they want with me? The thought of being handed off, of becoming part of someone's collection, was almost too much to bear. The journey felt interminable, each bump and turn of the vehicle magnified within the confines of my tiny prison. Time seemed to stretch endlessly, my sense of reality slipping as the hours or perhaps days crawled by. Every jolt sent tremors through my body, the ceaseless motion a cruel reminder of my helplessness. Encased in plastic and cardboard, I had no way of knowing where I was or how long it had been. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the motion ceased. The vehicle stopped, and the abrupt stillness was almost disorienting. I could hear muffled voices outside, indistinct and distant. Then, the box shifted, lifted again, and carried. My heart raced with anticipation and dread, wondering what awaited me. A loud, excited shriek pierced through the cardboard. OMG, OMG, it's here. I am so excited. The voice was female, and the sheer glee in her tone was unsettling. Suddenly, light flooded the box as it was opened, blinding me momentarily. I squinted, my eyes adjusting to the brightness. The plastic container that encased me was lifted out of the box, and I was brought up to the face of my new owner. As my vision cleared, I saw her, and my heart stopped. It was Momo Yayurazu. Her giant eyes, filled with excitement and wonder, stared down at me as she held my container in front of her face. I couldn't believe it. Of all people, why Momo? 
She was my classmate, someone I trusted. Seeing her like this, her features magnified and filled with a strange, almost predatory delight, was a shock. Now my collection can finally be completed, she murmured, her voice low and filled with awe. Wow, they must have started with a real pretty lady. Her words hit me like a physical blow. She didn't recognize me. To her, I was just another piece in her collection, a appealing doll to be admired. My heart sank as the reality of my situation deepened. Momo started walking, carrying me towards another room. The motion made my stomach lurch, but there was nothing I could do. We entered a room lined with shelves, each one filled with other dolls encased in similar plastic containers. As she approached one particular shelf, she turned me around, giving me a view of my new prison. Sailor Neptune was the only one missing from her living doll collection. I could see the eyes of the other dolls moving, their gazes filled with a mix of fear and resignation. Before I could fully process the horror of what I was seeing, Momo turned me back around and placed my container on the shelf. The view shifted to a row of other dolls, all perfectly displayed, their eyes following every movement. Momo stepped back, her eyes gleaming with pride as she admired her collection. She seemed utterly entranced, a collector marveling at her completed set. The irony was almost unbearable. Here was Momo, one of the most compassionate and caring people I knew, completely unaware of the suffering she was inflicting. She stood there for several minutes, lost in her admiration. Then, her phone rang, snapping her out of her reverie. Hello? Oh, hey, yeah, I'll be right there, she said, her tone light and cheerful. She turned towards the door, her hand reaching for the light SWCH. I can't wait to show my friends, she said to herself, a smile playing on her lips. As she left the room, the lights flicked off, plunging us into darkness. The door closed with a soft click, leaving me alone with my thoughts and the faint sounds of the other dolls shifting in their containers. In the oppressive silence, the weight of my situation pressed down on me. I was now part of Momo's collection, a living doll trapped in a display case. The fear and despair threatened to overwhelm me, but I clung to the hope that somehow, I would find a way out of this nightmare. The spirit of a hero burned within me, a tiny flame of determination that refused to be extinguished. No matter how hopeless things seemed, I would find a way to escape and reclaim my freedom. For now, all I could do was wait and plan, my mind racing with thoughts of how to turn this impossible situation around. Izuku Midoriya's world had transformed into a landscape of towering giants and colossal obstacles. Reduced to mere inches tall by a mysterious quirk, he now found himself resting on the expansive cushion of a chair, exhausted from his climb. The fabric beneath him was like a field of soft fibers, comforting yet overwhelming in its vastness. He lay there, catching his breath, his eyes fluttering shut as he tried to gather his strength for the next leg of his journey. The tranquility of his rest was shattered by powerful, rhythmic vibrations. His eyes snapped open, and he sat up, heart PND. The vibrations grew stronger, each one a seismic event in his miniature world. He turned his head, and his BLD ran cold. Ochako Yuraka was entering the room her gigantic form dominating his field of vision. She moved with casual grace, her eyes scanning the area for something, perhaps her phone. To her, everything seemed normal, but to Izuku, she was a towering, unstoppable force. Yuraraka, he shouted, his voice a tiny squeak against the cavernous room. He waved his arms frantically, but she was too far away to notice. His heart raced as she approached, her footfalls shaking the ground beneath him. As she neared the chair, Izuku's sense of urgency spiked, her colossal form was directly above him now, casting a vast shadow over his tiny body. She was wearing tight blue yoga breathe that accentuated her every movement, the fabric clinging to her form. He could see every detail, each contour and curve magnified from his perspective. His breath caught in his throat as she turned, her eyes still focused elsewhere. The realization hit him like a punch, she was about to sit down. Time seemed to slow as he watched her descend. Her yoga breathe stretched taut over her hips and thighs, emphasizing the expansive shape of her butt as she lowered herself toward the chair. Yuraraka, he screamed, but his voice was lost in the enormity of the moment. He scrambled to his feet, but there was no time to escape. The cushion compressed under her weight, and he felt the rush of air as her body settled onto the chair. Darkness enveloped him, and the soft fabric of her yoga breathe pressed down, immobilizing him. The pressure was intense but not crushing, the cushion beneath him absorbing some of the force. He could barely move, his tiny form pinned beneath her, the warmth of her body and the tight material surrounding him. He could feel the full weight of her sitting down, the plush cushion offering some relief but not nearly enough. Panic surged through him as he struggled to breathe. Yuraraka, he tried to shout again, but his voice was muffled. He could hear the faint sound of her humming, completely unaware of his predicament. She shifted slightly, making herself more comfortable, 
and the slight movements caused the fabric around him to shift as well. Each movement pressed him deeper into the cushion, her butt a looming presence above him, pressing him down and holding him captive. Suddenly, he felt a tickling sensation against her. Ochako paused her humming, frowning slightly. What's that? She murmured to herself. She felt an itch but dismissed it as nothing more than a stray fiber or a wrinkle in her yoga breathe. She adjusted herself in the seat, the weight and pressure shifting, and then settling back down, pressing Izuku more firmly into the cushion. The renewed pressure forced the air out of his lungs, and he struggled to breathe, his tiny movements becoming weaker, his mind raced with desperation. He began to wiggle his fingers and toes, hoping the slight tickling sensation might catch her attention again. At first, nothing happened. He kept at it, his tiny movements driven by sheer willpower. Ochako shifted once more, this time leaning forward to grab something from the table. The pressure eased slightly, and Izuku seized the moment to push against the fabric with all his might. His efforts were met with limited success, and she settled back down, her weight pinning him even more firmly than before. Izuku's strength was fading. He tried to shout again, but his voice was barely a whisper. The pressure and the lack of air were overwhelming. He felt himself slipping, the edges of his vision darkening. His tiny form lay motionless, the warmth of Ochako's body and the soft fabric enveloping him completely. Above, Ochako finished what she was doing and stood up, none the wiser to the tiny hero trapped beneath her. She walked out of the room, her thoughts already on the next task at hand. Izuku lay there, barely conscious, as the vibrations of her footsteps faded into the distance. He knew he had to stay awake, had to keep fighting, but the exhaustion was too much. His eyes fluttered shut once more, and darkness claimed him. Hours later, his friends would find him, still tiny but alive, and work to reverse the quirk that had caused this nightmare. But for now, Izuku Midoriya remained trapped, a tiny hero lost in a world of giants. One day, as I wandered through the hallways of Yue University, my mind preoccupied with the endless challenges of hero training, midnight, my enigmatic and somewhat eccentric teacher, approached me with an unusual glint in her eye. Her long black hair flowed behind her, and she wore her usual mischievous smile. Izuku, she called, her voice a melodic yet authoritative tone. That always managed to capture attention. I have a fun science experiment for you. Curiosity peaked, I followed her to the support department, a section of the university that always buzzed with energy and innovation. As we entered, the smell of metal, oil, and other mechanical scents filled the air, mingling with the excited chatter of students and the hum of various contraptions at work. My eyes landed on Meihatsum, the department's resident genius inventor, who was standing next to a giant clear. The, roughly the size of a small car, had a seat inside equipped with seat belts, and it sparkled under the fluorescent lights of the lab. Midnight strode confidently next to thee, her arms spread wide as if unveiling a grand masterpiece. Tada! she exclaimed, her voice ringing with excitement. However, my initial reaction was one of confusion. I looked from midnight to May and back to midnight, my mind racing to understand the purpose of this bizarre contraption. Do you trust me, Izuku? Midnight asked, her voice suddenly serious, eyes locking onto mine with an intensity that was strong to ignore. I am a teacher at Yua after all. I hesitated, trying to find a reasonable response. Midnight had proven her wisdom and trustworthiness time and again, but this… this was something else entirely. Nevertheless, my curiosity outweighed my caution. I trust you, Midnight, I finally said, the words coming out more confident than I felt. Good, she said with a smile, patting me on the back. Now, get in. I carefully stepped into the, the plastic cool under my touch. Once inside, I sat down and buckled myself in, the seatbelt clicking securely around me. The S interior was surprisingly comfortable, designed to accommodate its occupants snugly. As the door closed, sealing me inside, I heard a faint click followed by the soft hum of a hidden mechanism. The sound was both reassuring and a little unnerving, as if there was coming to life. From my transparent enclosure, I watched as Midnight and May exchanged words. Are you sure this will survive the whole trip? Midnight asked her voice muffled slightly by the s-thick walls. May's response was instant and indignant. Of course it will. I built it, didn't I? This baby can withstand anything. Her eyes sparkled with the fervor of a creator defending her masterpiece. Confusion and a hint of anxiety gnawed at me, but before I could voice my concerns, Midnight turned her attention back to me. Her expression softened, and she spoke with the calm authority of a teacher guiding a student through an important lesson. Izuku, I need you to shrink yourself and be as small as you can. I blinked, taken aback by the request. My quirk, which allowed me to shrink myself and others down to an inch tall, was not something I used frequently, especially not on objects of this size. 
However, Midnight's confidence was infectious, and I found myself nodding in agreement. All right, I said, taking a deep breath to steady my nerves. Closing my eyes, I focused on the sensation of my quirk activating. A warm, tingling energy spread from my core, flowing outwards to encompass the, the familiar sensation of shrinking, a mix of compression and weightlessness, enveloped me. I could feel the responding to my quirk, its dimensions contracting as the world around me expanded exponentially. As the shrinking continued, the details of the lab grew larger and more imposing. The once modest room transformed into a vast, cavernous space, the equipment towering like skyscrapers. The floor beneath the, once smooth and unremarkable, now appeared as an expansive, uneven terrain. The itself adapted to its reduced size, the mechanisms inside ensuring my safety, even at this minuscule scale. The sensation was both exhilarating and disorienting, like riding a roller coaster that defied the laws of physics. Finally, when I could shrink no further, I opened my eyes to a world that was both familiar and utterly alien. The colossal figures of Midnight and May loomed above me, their features exaggerated by the sheer difference in scale. Their voices, now a thunderous rumble, echoed around me, creating a surreal and almost dreamlike atmosphere. This is just the beginning. Hold tight, because the real fun is about to start Midnight's voice boomed, her face filling my entire field of vision. As I sat in the tiny, the enormity of the experiment began to sink in. The support department, with its endless innovations and creative minds, was the perfect backdrop for such an unusual endeavor. The air crackled with potential, and despite my initial trepidation, I felt a growing sense of anticipation. What adventures awaited me in this new, shrunken world? Only time would tell. Midnight's towering form bent over, her movements slow and deliberate, like a goddess descending from the heavens as her giant fingers wrapped around the eye I'm in and brought the up to her face. Her enormous eyes, each one the size of a swimming pool from my shrunken perspective, loomed in front of me, filling my entire field of vision. The irises glistened with curiosity and excitement as she examined the tiny I was in. Her breath fogged the surface momentarily, a warm and humid reminder of her immense scale. Thank you, May, she said, her voice reverberating through the, causing it to vibrate slightly. With a nod from May, Midnight turned on her heel and began to walk out of the lab. The world around me blurred into a dizzying whirl of motion. Midnight's arms swung lightly at her sides, but to me, it felt like I was on a relentless roller coaster, swaying side to side with each of her steps. I tried to focus on the interior of the, its clear walls providing a distorted view of the vast hallway stretching out endlessly as we moved. The rhythmic thud of her footsteps was a constant reminder of the immense power and scale of my surroundings. The journey to the cafeteria seemed to stretch on indefinitely, each second magnified by my miniature perspective. Time felt elongated, every moment filled with the anticipation of what was to come. Finally, the vast expanse of the cafeteria came into view, its ceiling soaring high above like the vaults of a cathedral. The aroma of food, amplified by my tiny size, wafted around me, a mix of savory and sweet scents that were almost overwhelming. Midnight paused, scanning the room with her sharp eyes. Her gaze settled on a table across the room, filled with the familiar faces of my classmates from Class 1A. She made her way towards them, each step bringing a new wave of motion and sound. As she approached the table, she did an arm around Momoya Yurazu, who looked up in surprise. Hey everyone, Midnight's voice boomed. Izuku won't be around for a few days. He's helping me with something classified. As she spoke, I felt the shift. In a swift, almost imperceptible motion, she let it slip from her fingers and into Momo's cup of water. The descent was sudden, and I splashed down into the cool liquid, the bobbing on the surface like a tiny boy. From my position, I could see the distorted, giant faces of my classmates as they interacted, completely unaware of my presence. I watched them with a mix of awe and trepidation. Their gestures, their voices, everything was magnified and surreal from my minuscule viewpoint. What was Midnight's plan here? What was she trying to teach me? My thoughts swirled with questions, each one more pressing than the last. My musings were interrupted by the sudden shadow cast over the cup. Momo's enormous hand, graceful yet powerful, wrapped around the glass, the movement was smooth and elegant, but to me, it felt like the onset of a great tidal wave. The cup lifted, and I was suddenly airborne, the liquid inside sloshing gently. I watched in helpless fascination as Momo brought the cup to her lips, her mouth opening wide. The world tilted, and I was swept up by the current, the water rushing into her mouth. The interior of her mouth was a cavernous, glistening expanse, the sounds of her breath and heartbeat echoing around me. In a final, helpless moment, I was pulled down her throat, the tumbling end over end in the dark, narrow passage. The descent was rapid and disorienting. I felt the pressure of her muscles around the, guiding it downward with rhythmic contractions. 
Finally, I landed in her stomach, the settling in the warm, liquid-filled chamber. The sounds of her body surrounded me gurgles, pulses, the steady thrum of her heartbeat. I was inside Momo, a tiny, almost inconceivable presence within her. The reality of my situation settled in, and I could only wonder what Midnight's ultimate goal was and how I would navigate this strange, new environment. As I reached the dark, pulsating chamber of Momo's stomach, a series of small but bright lights flickered on around the exterior of the... The illumination cast a soft, white glow, revealing the intricate details of my surroundings. The walls of her stomach, undulating rhythmically with each breath and heartbeat, were a mix of reddish-pink hues, glistening with a thin layer of mucus. It was both mesmerizing and slightly unsettling, a constant reminder of the biological marvel and the bizarre reality I was experiencing. I looked around with mild fascination, marveling at the strange, otherworldly environment. The liquid around the shimmered with a faint, acidic glow, tiny bubbles rising to the surface. The sounds were amplified inside the, the gurgling of digestive juices, the rhythmic contractions of muscles, and the steady, almost soothing thump of Momo's heartbeat above me. Finally, I thought I understood Midnight's idea. This wasn't just a simple shrinking experiment. It was an immersive lesson in human biology, an opportunity to experience firsthand the inner workings of the human body. As I pondered my situation, Momo continued to eat, her chewed food occasionally dropping down around me like meteors plunging into an alien sea. Each morsel splashed into the liquid, sending ripples and waves that rocked the violently. The sensation was akin to being tossed about in a turbulent ocean, the careening wildly in the churning liquid. I braced myself against the seat, gripping the sides tightly as though was buffeted from all sides. The movement was relentless, a chaotic dance dictated by Momo's digestive processes. Bits of chewed food, now partially broken down, floated past the, adding to the surreal tableau. I watched in a mix of awe and discomfort as the was swept along with the flow of the digestive juices, carried deeper into the intricate maze of her digestive system. After what felt like an eternity, the began to move more steadily, guided by the powerful contractions of her intestines. The journey through her digestive tract was a slow, methodical process that propelled forward in a series of rhythmic waves. The lights on the provided a constant, reassuring glow, illuminating the narrow, twisting passageway. The walls around me pulsed with life, the soft, wet tissue stretching and contracting with each peristaltic movement. The entire experience was both fascinating and shocking. As the continued its journey, I could see the different stages of digestion, food being broken down into smaller and smaller particles, nutrients absorbed through the walls of the intestines, and the remaining waste material gradually compacted into solid form. It was a biological symphony, a testament to the complexity and efficiency of the human body. Eventually, they reached the final stage of its journey, entering Momo's anal cavity. The space was darker, the rhythmic contractions more deliberate and forceful. There was now attached to the end of a giant log of waste, a surreal and slightly disconcerting position. The smells and sounds were more intense here, a stark reminder of the body's ability to process and eliminate waste. As I sat in the, reflecting on the incredible journey I had just experienced, a faint light began to shine at the end of the long, dark tunnel. It was a beacon of hope, signaling the end of my strange and enlightening odyssey through Momo's digestive system. The light grew brighter, illuminating the path ahead, and I felt a sense of anticipation building within me. What awaited me beyond this final passage? How would I emerge from this extraordinary experience, and what lessons would I carry with me? The move steadily towards the light, the end of the tunnel drawing nearer with each passing moment. I braced myself for whatever lay ahead, ready to face the next chapter of this incredible journey. The log of waste began to move, slowly but inevitably, carrying the end me toward the beckoning light. The rhythmic contractions of Momo's muscles pushed us forward, the walls around us narrowing and expanding in a steady cadence. Each moment felt like an eternity, every second stretched out as the biological machinery of her body performed its final tasks. The pressure and heat were intense, the sounds of her body a constant reminder of my surreal journey. The light grew brighter, and I squinted against its overwhelming brilliance, my eyes struggling to adjust after the darkness. Suddenly, the walls around me widened, and I felt the propelled into the blinding radiance. I was falling, the sensation of weightlessness enveloping me. The tumbled end over end, the world outside a blur of light and shadow. My mind struggled to keep up with a rapid shift in environment, the intense brightness making it strong to see. The fall seemed to last forever, each second a small eternity as I awaited the inevitable landing. With a sudden jolt, the splashed down into a giant pool of water. The impact sent ripples cascading across the surface, the bobbing up and down as it settled. The cool water was a stark contrast to the warm, humid interior I had just left. 
Slowly, I began to regain my bearings, the initial shock giving way to a clearer understanding of my surroundings. As my vision adjusted to the light, I looked up and my eyes widened in horror. I realized where I was in a giant toilet bowl, the white porcelain walls loomed high above, and the water around me was vast and intimidating. Above me, Momo's giant buttocks hovered, an overwhelming and surreal sight. She moved with the unconscious grace of someone performing a routine task, completely unaware of my presence. I watched, transfixed and horrified, as she reached for toilet paper and wiped herself. The giant piece of toilet paper was dropped into the bowl, landing with a splash that sent waves rolling towards the... It floated nearby, massive and imposing, yet somehow missing my tiny vessel. The sheer scale of it all was both fascinating and terrifying, a reminder of how small and insignificant I was in this moment. Then, Momo stood up, her skirt rustling as she adjusted it back into place. She bent over slightly, her hand reaching for the handle. The shadow of her immense form cast over me, and I felt a moment of utter helplessness. The water around me began to swirl, the currents growing stronger with each passing second. I looked up one last time to see Momo walking away, her towering figure receding into the distance. The water spun faster, the cod in the growing vortex. I could do nothing as the powerful currents pulled me around, the centrifugal force pressing me against the sides of the... The world outside became a blur of motion, the overwhelming sensation of being caught in a whirlpool consuming me. The water swirled and swirled, the force dragging me deeper and deeper into the drain. The sounds of rushing water filled my ears, and I could feel the being SCK down into the darkness. The last sliver of light disappeared, replaced by the cold, black void of the drain pipe. The sensation of motion was relentless, the tumbling through the narrow passage with dizzying speed. My heart PND in my chest as the was carried along, the journey through the pipes a chaotic, frenzied descent. The light at the end of the tunnel had led me here, to this inescapable plunge into the unknown. As the spiraled further into the depths, I clung to the hope that this experience, however bizarre and terrifying, had a purpose. And so, they continued its journey, swallowed by the dark, winding path of the drain, the world above left far behind. Midnight sat at her desk, bathed in the soft, flickering light of her laptop screen. Her dark, wavy hair cascaded over her shoulders, framing her face, which was illuminated by the soft glow. A mischievous smile played on her lips as her eyes followed the images playing out before her. The video on the screen showed a tiny, translucent moving through a surreal and bizarre journey, a narrative that seemed plucked from a fantastical dream. The footage was incredibly detailed, capturing every moment of Izuku's miniature adventure inside Momo's body. Midnight's smile widened as she watched the get flushed down the toilet, the swirling water creating a hypnotic whirlpool that marked the end of the journey. The entire sequence was a blend of the grotesque and the fascinating, a testament to the intricate and sometimes strange nature of her teaching methods. As the video finished, Midnight leaned back in her chair, her fingers dancing over the laptop's keyboard. She clicked a few items on the screen, navigating through menus and folders with practiced ease. Her eyes sparkled with a mix of satisfaction and anticipation. And saved, she said aloud, her voice taking on a SNSL, almost purring tone. Can't wait to watch this again later. The room around her was dimly lit, filled with the soft hum of electronics and the faint scent of lavender. Papers and gadgets cluttered her desk, a testament to her dual roles as a hero and an educator. The laptop's light cast long shadows, adding a touch of drama to the scene. Midnight's reflection in the screen was a blend of pride and amusement, a teacher satisfied with the completion of an unusual lesson. She closed the laptop gently, the click of the lid snapping shut resonating in the quiet room. Her thoughts lingered on Izuku's experience, contemplating the lessons learned and the reactions it would invoke. Midnight's methods were unconventional, but she believed in their effectiveness. This particular experiment had pushed boundaries, both physically and psychologically, and she relished the thought of the impact it would have on her student. With a final, satisfied sigh, Midnight stood up, stretching her arms above her head. The video was saved, a testament to a day's work filled with the unexpected and the extraordinary. She moved gracefully through the room, her mind already buzzing with ideas for future lessons, each one more intriguing and challenging than the last.